House will come to order. <laughs> Messages from the Senate. <clears throat> Message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following Senate file herewith transmitted. Senate file number 3881, the message is signed Thomas S. Bodder, Secretary of the Senate. First reading of Senate files. First reading of Senate file number 3881, an act relating to transportation designating a portion of marked U.S. Highway 169 between Marble and Mountain Iron as Senator David J. Tomasoni Memorial Cross Range Expressway. Pursuant to Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, Liz Lagarde moves that the rule therein be suspended and an urgency be declared and that the rules of the House be so far suspended so that Senate File Number 3881 be given its second and third readings and be placed upon its final passage. The member from St. Louis, Representative Liz Lagarde, to your motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That is my motion. Representative Liz Lagarde moves to declare an urgency. All those in favor of the Liz Lagarde motion, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. I'll give the, bill a second reading. the clerk will give the bill its second reading. <clears throat> second reading, Senate file number 3881. Second reading. I recognize the member from St. Louis, Representative Liz Lagarde, to address the bill. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and members, and uh, yes, it is uh, an emergency for our dear friend David. Um, I'm here today to present uh, House File uh, 4237, naming a portion of Highway 169 from Marble to uh, Mount Iron in honor of him. Um, most of you know David was a dear friend of mine. He was a mentor, and uh, he was a proud Iron Ranger. He was born and raised there, and uh, he always said Chisholm was the center of the universe. And we have a page right down front, uh, down front and he's from Chisholm. So uh, David, we'd be honored that you're here today. Um, David was a, going back into history, David was a very talented individual. Um, he played hockey, go figure, from the state of Minnesota of hockey. He played D1 at the University of Minnesota, or excuse me, he'd be mad at me right there, uh, University of Denver. Um, and then he played in 1984, he played for Italy in the Olympics. Um, he had a long professional career in hockey in Italy, uh, spanning from 1975 to 19, uh, 1991. Um, a little side note, having a conversation with uh, our very own Pat Murphy. Um, Pat um, played hockey with him and uh, he said that I can't tell all the stories in the locker room, but he said they would be entertaining. Um, <laughs> But um, after that, um, David came home and he got into politics and I'm very, um, I'm happy they got into politics because he taught me so much. During his time as a legislator, he chaired several commit committees um, and he started in the House. Um, and then in 2001, he came over to the Senate. And so we always joked that uh, David was house trained before going over to the Senate. And uh, he, he, he was one of them guys that didn't look down on no one. He didn't care if uh, it was the Senate or the House or you were rich or you were poor. David was David, and David loved people. Um, he was a defender of the Iron Range. He knew what it meant to be a Ranger. He did put people before politics. He worked across the aisle. David didn't rule by an iron fist. David ruled with finesse, but he was tough. He just, he was tough with love. He really, truly cared. And if you knew him, you would know that he is one of the most sincere, kind people. And all you gotta do is look at his children. His children are very much the same and they are very, very proud of their father. But I, uh, in 2000, uh, let's see here, in the mid 2021, our dear friend um, was diagnosed with ALS. And uh, I remember when I got the phone call, um, 
Um, I was COVID and I was pacing in my uh, backyard, go figure. And, um, and he told me, and I, I was just, I didn't know what to say. What do you say when your dear friend um, tells you about a disease um, that, that is incurable? And, um, and then being David who David was, he took on that fight knowing full well that there was no cure for ALS. It was David who did push that legislation, the largest legislation ever for ALS, $20 million, $5 million for caregiving for ALS people, knowing full well that he would not benefit from what we accomplished. I know I probably would have been afraid. I probably would have went into a shell, but not David. Not David. When a, Knowledge um, Representative New Brindley, who uh, was there, and she understands that disease. Um, but it was a very, very difficult time to, to watch that. But that's who he was, and he fought all the way to the end. There's going to be some other people to talk, but, you know, I just got to say that um, I wouldn't be who I am without him today. I really wouldn't be. And so this is an honor of him. I'm going to tell you one story because David would not want all sad. So he taught me a lot. I was down here. I used to drive him, right? And uh, when we first got here, we passed that no texting uh, legislation. And I voted for it, safety. Well, I'm driving him around, and I'm, uh, I'm texting. And he looks at me, and he goes, you shouldn't text and drive. And I went, oh, OK. You know, I didn't want to disappoint him. And then about two weeks later, we're up on the range on this very highway we're going to name for him. He's driving. And what we, his nickname was Guido. And he's texting. And I'm thinking there, I said, hey, Guido, you just told me that I can't text two weeks ago. And you're texting. He looks at me and he goes, I didn't vote for the bill. That's who he was. Um, he was a great man, and I know some other people are going to talk, so um, that is the bill. Discussion to the bill. The member from St. Louis, Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative <coughs> uh, Liz Lagarde. I didn't get to serve with Senator Tomasoni. I was the mayor of Ely, and I did little things uh, for our community, and the bonding committee would come through, and David was part of it. And I remember cooking fish one year, and David says, what are you doing this fall? <laughs> he wanted a fundraiser. He's like, you come cook for me. Cause, and he's that kind of guy. He's always looking for an angle. He was always good. He always took care of the range. Uh, the least that I can do is to support him, uh, his name on that highway. And the other thing I will promote uh, there is a ride, a bicycle ride, on September 19th through the 21st at Fortune Bay. It's on the Iron Range. It's on the Masabi Trail. It's for ALS, and it is an opportunity to meet David's uh, people. Everyone will be there. It's a great ride. It, it drives. You can ride your bike to Ely, to, to Chisholm, whichever direction you want to go out of there. It's going to be a great opportunity, and I have to do that shameless plug for David's opportunity. And thank you, and I look forward to uh, signing everything tomorrow. Thank you. Discussion. The member from Itasca, Representative Igo. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to both my colleagues for the words on behalf of Senator Tomasoni. Um, I just want to leave, you know, I think one of the greatest things that David did in his time down here, but also being a member of the range, was he set the example of what it is to be a true statesman, um, work with both sides of the aisle, um, but make every single person who ever talked to him and interacted with him, they felt like the most important person in the room. Um, so this, this legislation today that we're going to put in place to commemorate this highway uh, for him isn't just for the people of the range to remember him, because we're going to remember him for a long time. Uh, it's for the people of Minnesota, but it's also for the people of both chambers in this legislature to remember what it was like to have a man who really was larger than life, that could work with everybody, made everyone laugh, made everyone smile, but delivered things that lifted up every single Minnesotan, regardless of party. Um, a close story that I have uh, with the senator was when I first started um, getting involved in politics and I was working on the range, it was 
very new on the job. Um, and I was going into rooms that made me very uncomfortable. I was a new kid on the block in a sense and didn't really know who to talk to or how to make myself heard and represent the folks I had to represent when I was there. But uh, David always made sure to grab me from the back of the room and sit me up front next to him and said, you're here for a reason, Spencer. And uh, I remember that every day because I look back at a moment like that and that's what inspired me to kind of lead me to where I'm at today because he pushed people to do that. Everybody who comes from the range in some sense, whether you work in politics, whether you're a community advocate, whether you just go out into the world and say your home's the range, has a story like that with David. Um, and I'm just really glad that we had this urgency today to move this forward um, and to do this uh, for the region, for his family, uh, and for our state. So let's remember David's legacy with, as we go through these days of session and the years ahead, what it's like to be a true statesman. And let's put this highway in his name. Thank you. The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and thank you, Representative Liz Lagarde. Um, I had the opportunity over the past few years to spend some time with Senator Tomasoni, and um, I, I, love, I love the comments about uh, him being a statesman, but I would also add that he was a baller. Like, <laughs> he knew how to get stuff done. <laughs> um, and it was fun to watch him work. It was really fun to watch him work. And um, shortly before his diagnosis was announced publicly, uh, we, had, we were having dinner uh, with some friends. And he was very quiet, which was a little unusual. Um, and, and so when that diagnosis came and was announced, it all sort of came together for me. Um, but I am so grateful for who he was. I am so grateful that in his final months, he didn't lose that fighting spirit and he got stuff done because <laughs> that's who he was. I, I was sitting in his office. He always had, there was always a ton of food in his office at the end of session when we're in and out all day long and wait, hurrying up and waiting. And, and there were several of us in his office and, and he started pulling out the swag. And I have my, I have my David Tomasoni mug sitting on my, on my windowsill in my kitchen. So I see it almost every day, the, day I, the days I choose to do the dishes. Um, I see that David Tomasoni mug sitting there. And that, that is something that I will cherish forever knowing how he chose to spend his life serving the people of his community, that he chose in his final months to fight for a community that he became a part of, that I too am a part of. I'm so grateful for who he was, for who he is, and I am grateful for this opportunity that we have to honor him in this way. Senator Tomasoni deserves this. Further discussion? Representative Lislagard. Oh, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator Tomasoni certainly had an impact uh, on my life as well. Uh, the youngest years of, of my political involvement as well. Um, a member of the other side of the aisle, a member of the middle, a member, a member um, supporting his community. And one thing that I especially became fond of was his ability in any room, but especially back in his own community, to reference things like the Bible. And he would stand before a political convention or he would stand before his entire community and recite a verse. And I think I've got it right here. I tried to pull it up just as quickly as I could here. Um, and this is, uh, in, I believe it's Deuteronomy 8. For the Lord, uh, Deuteronomy 8, 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills. A land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey. A land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. And a land where the rocks are iron, and you can dig copper out of the hills. And that speaks well to Senator Thomasoni, a great friend of the state of Minnesota. 
Further discussion, the member from Meeker, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I had many occasions when I was uh, with uh, Senator Thomas Sony and uh, being with my connection with bonding, uh, the senator was very interested in me. And I asked him once, uh, I need to know what your priorities are, Senator Tomasoni. Would you please tell me? And so he took out a sheet of paper and he wrote down his priorities, handed them to me, and I said, could you prioritize them for me? Handed it back, gives it back to me, and it's ten items. One, 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 <laughs> one, one. And I said, they're all number one. He says, everything is number one on the range. <laughs> and in my last memory, of, of seeing him, uh, it was early in, in the session and he was uh, around the rotunda uh, railing over here behind us. And I walked by him, he couldn't talk at that time, but I just said hello to him and he just looked at me and went, <laughs> we'll miss him. Discussion. Representative Lissagard. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just in closing, um, one thing that uh, David was, was a man of few words. He didn't need to be the big show um, on the floor or in life. He just brought people together and got stuff done, and I would ask you to vote green. Thank you. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate file number 3881. Third reading. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. Will the clerk please call the names of the members who are voting remotely? Carol. Carol, yes. Carol I. Howard. Howard votes yes. Howard I. Cagle. Cagle I. Cagle I. Tabkey. Tabkey I. Tabkey I. <clears throat> The clerk will close the roll. There being 129 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Messages from the Senate. <clears throat> A message from the Senate, Madam Speaker, I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following House file, herewith returned as amended by the Senate, in which amendments the concurrence of the House is respectfully requested. House file number 3454, an act relating to the military. The message is signed Thomas S. Potter, Secretary of the Senate. Norris moved that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House file number 3454 and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Senate. The member from Anoka, Representative Norris, to your motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. That is my motion. Uh, many of the provisions in the version of the bill that came back from the Senate already passed uh, the full mm -hmm. House unanimously in either my Department of Military Affairs policy bill or Representative Olson's Veterans Policy Bill. Um, there's a few new provisions that were added by the Senate, um, a Representative Hudella Bill allowing county veteran service officers to obtain certified copies of birth certificates, death certificates, other vital records without charge, a Representative Olson Bill with modifications to the Adjutant General's authority uh, regarding armories, a Representative Greenman Bill uh, updating language uh, reflecting how Veterans Affairs is operating pharmacies in our vet's homes. Homes, a Representative Elkins bill allowing counties to appropriate money for the observance of Veterans Day in addition to Memorial Day. Uh, members, all of these provisions uh, were authored by a mix of Democrats and Republicans. Uh, they've been passed out of the House 
uh, Veterans Committee, and as a result, I recommend a green vote on the concurrence to send this bipartisan bill to support our National Guard and Minnesota vets to the governor's desk. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Discussion on the Norris motion. The member from, can't see anything today, Representative Olson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I would recommend that we all uh, concur with this motion here. As a result, it's a very creative and necessary way of, of dealing with some of the crazy stuff that's going on in the Senate. These are bills that absolutely need to be passed this year. They're good, they're bipartisan, and they're, they're pro-veteran, they're pro-military. So I would recommend a yes vote for this concurrence uh, to ensure that, that good is done for our military and for our veterans. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion to concur, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The clerk will give it the bill its third reading as amended by the Senate. Third reading, House Law number 3454, as amended by the Senate. Third reading, as amended by the Senate. Any further discussion to the bill? The member from Anoka, Representative Newton. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Representative Norris for carrying this bill. This is a truly bipartisan bill that contains uh, virtually uh, every member of the House Veterans Committee uh, had uh, participation in the bill, and I encourage a green vote. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Will the clerk please call the names of the members who are voting remotely? Carol. There you go. Carol I. Carol I. Howard. Howard votes aye. Howard I. Cagle. Cagle I. Tabkey. Tabkey I. Tabkey I. The clerk will close the roll. There being 131 ayes and zero nays, the bill is repassed as amended by the Senate and its title agreed to. Reports from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. Long from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration, pursuant to Rules 1.21 and 3.33, designates the following bills to be placed on the calendar for the day for Friday, May 3rd, 2024, and establishes a pre-filing requirement for amendments offered to the following bills. House file number 5299 and 5216, and Senate file number 5289. Calendar for the day. The first bill on the calendar for the day is House File 3488. The clerk will report the bill. House File number 3488, number one on the calendar for the day, an act relating to labor, the third engrossment. I recognize the member from Anoka, the author of the bill, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This bill relates to the phenomenon of children working as social media influencers. And Many of you are probably not familiar with this concept, so let me tell you the story of Samia, as told by the New York Times. Samia was an influencer before she could talk. Her parents, Adam and Latoya Ali, are influencers themselves and began chronicling Samia's impending arrival on YouTube and Instagram in 2014 once Ms. Ali learned that she was pregnant. Samia's birth video is on YouTube, and so she's pretty much been born into social media, Mr. Ali said. Samia is now four and has 143,000 followers on Instagram and 203,000 subscribers on YouTube. Her feeds are mostly populated with the posts of her posing and playing, but they also feature paid pro promotions for brands like Crayola, Homestyle Harvest Chicken Nuggets. This can be big money, members. According to the Washington Post, mom influencing is a billion dollar industry. Kyle Fisher, the father of two-year-old identical twins who have more than two million followers on Instagram, said a sponsored post on the girl's account could fetch between ten dollars and $20,000. This also has a very dark side. Uh, consider the phenomena of mommy-run accounts. 
These are social media accounts purportedly for young children, but actually run by their parents. Some of these accounts feature scantily clad pictures of teen and preteen girls. Some of these accounts offer access to even more content behind a paywall. The New York Times recently did a massive investigation into these accounts across multiple platforms. The results are incredibly disturbing. Alyssa had been running her daughter's Instagram account since 2020, when the girl was 11 and too young to have her own. Photos show a bright, bubbly girl modeling evening dresses, high-end workout gear, and dance leotards. She has more than 100,000 followers, some so enthusiastic about her posts that they pay $9.99 a month for more photos. Over the years, Alyssa has filled all kinds of criticism and knows full well that some people think she's exploiting her daughter. She has gotten used to receiving creepy messages. I think they're all pedophiles, she said, of the many online followers obsessed with her daughter and other young girls. Thousands of accounts examined by the New York Times offer disturbing insight into how social media is reshaping childhood, especially for girls, with direct parental encouragement and involvement. Some parents are the driving force behind the sale of photos, exclusive chat sessions, and even the girls worn leotards and cheer outfits to a mostly unknown followers. The most devoted customers spend thousands of dollars nurturing these underage relationships. One calculation performed by an audience demographics firm found 32 million connections to male followers among 5,000 accounts examined by the Times. Interacting with the men opens the doors to abuse. Some flatter, bully, and blackmail girls and their parents to get racier and racier images. The Times monitored separate exchanges on Telegram, the messaging app, where men openly fantasize about sexually abusing the children they now follow on Instagram and extol the platform for making those images so readily available. Quote, it's like a candy store. Quote, God bless Instamoms. In interviews and online comments, parents said that their children enjoyed being on social media or that it was important for a future career, but some expressed misgivings. Kaylin, whose daughter is now 17, said she worried that a childhood spent sporting bikinis online for adult men had scarred her. Quote, she's written herself off and decided that the only way she's going to have a future is to make a mint on OnlyFans, she said, referring to a website that allows users to sell adult content to subscribers. She has more than that to offer. She warned mothers not to make their children social media influencers. With the wisdom and knowledge I have now, if I could go back, I definitely wouldn't do it, she said. I've been stupidly, naively feeding a pack of monsters, and the regret is huge. Account owners who report explicit images or potential predators to Instagram are typically met with silence or indifference, and those who block many abusers have seen their own accounts' ability to use certain features limited, according to the interviews and documents. In the course of eight months, the Times made over 50 reports about its own, of its own about questionable material and received only one response. Meta, Instagram's parent company, found that 500,000 child Instagram accounts had inappropriate interactions every day, every day, according to an internal study in 2020 uh, that was revealed in legal proceedings. It's a brave new world, members, and it's one that we need to put guardrails on now. This bill does two things. One, it builds out from our existing child labor laws and establishes that children under the age of 14 cannot work as social media influencers. The second thing it does is say for children who are older than that, that they should be guaranteed a portion of the profits. We have to set aside some of the money in a trust account for their benefit when they're older. This is a concept that might sound familiar to you because it's, been one, that's, it's one that's been in place for many decades in some jurisdictions for TV and film child actors to prevent parents and managers from um, uh, taking advantage of them and stealing all the money. Other states have introduced legislation like this. Illinois has passed it. Uh, California has passed it many years ago for, for film and, and TV. Uh, members, I think that this is an important bill that we take, uh, that we pass today, and I look forward to a good discussion. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House Bill number 3488. Third reading. Discussion to the bill. To the member from Anoka, Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Stevenson, for this discussion. Um, and, and thank you, uh, for referencing that New York Times article. Um, we, uh, you and I have had a chance to talk about that a few times in, in committees, and um, I hope every, uh, not only every member 
of this body reads that article, but I hope every parent um, in Minnesota reads that article because it is, it is really shocking. Um, and I think, my, I think I told you my first reaction, and we've, I've seen, we've talked about this bill a couple times in a couple committees, I think I told you my first reaction to this was uh, that it doesn't go far enough in dealing with some of those particular types of instances. And frankly, I think, you know, um, some of those situations are probably child protection level um, situations. There's some really disgusting stuff happening with some parents who are uh, really exploiting their kids. Um, and I think if there was a way that we could have a vote on whether th some of those specific instances should be prohibited or, or maybe even uh, more significant sanctions were allowed in those circumstances, I think we'd probably have a unanimous vote. Um, I'm a little worried we might not have a unanimous vote on this particular bill because the devil does get into the details. And so I wanted to explore with you a little bit about... Um, because this is a hard, this is, and I, I appreciate this is a very hard area um, to draw those kind of legal lines, especially uh, some of the things we would want to do probably are content um, regulation, and, and that, gets, that gets tricky. But I did want to um, explore a little bit about how the, how the bill does try to draw those lines. And I, I appreciate there was a lot of good faith work done to try to draw those lines um, appropriately. And so the first question, if uh, Representative Stevenson would yield. Representative Stephen will yield. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Stevenson, I, um, I'm trying to understand exactly how this applies in a situation which the um, person creating the content is the the uh, is either a child some may, may uh, I think there's distinctions between maybe a 14 year old minor and maybe even a 12 year old minor if if a, if someone is completely uh, the the minor themselves is totally responsible for the without like an adult um, overseeing them and in particular um, a lot of the definitions here are driven by um, the terms uh, engaged in the work of content creation and then content creator and in particular, you know, on lines 2.2 and 2.3, it says, content creator does not include a person under the age of 18 who produces their own video content. So um, what I think, and maybe there's a little bit more clarification that could be done in here. What, um, how does this bill regulate, if at all, a 12-year-old who's creating their own content without any adult supervision, um, if they're able to somehow get, you know, a, an account somewhere, or a 14-year-old who is solely creating their own uh, content without adult supervision. Um, I think maybe those kids are not regulated at all by the bill, but I'm curious to hear um, if that's correct or how, in what ways they might be regulated by the bill. Representative Stevenson. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Niska. And you kind of alluded to one important fact, which is that in the United States, children under the age of 13 are not allowed to have uh, their own um, uh, their own platforms. And so when we're talking about children under the age of 13, what we're really focusing on here are those mommy-run accounts or the parent-run accounts that I discussed earlier, where a parent is posting things, managing the account on behalf of their, their minor child. When you get above that age, then of course, um, a, a minor child can have uh, their own account. And so it's, it's different in that respect. Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate that, Representative Stevenson. And obviously, uh, yes, I, um, the, generally the age of consent in most platforms are, 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 met, are trying to keep uh, kids off who are under uh, 13. Um, I, I think it's possible, and I think, I think the way I read the bill, maybe there's some more clarification that could be done, but I think the way I read the bill, that wouldn't, and the, the bill wouldn't do anything to regulate uh, uh, that situation, uh, mostly because there wouldn't be any work of content creation happening with a con if, the, if, the, um, if there was no content creator who was over the age of 18. And I think that's probably good. I think, that's, I think we probably should leave that um, uh, unregulated, at least as we're trying to deal with the particular problem that you're raising, which, again, I agree is a very serious, um, serious problem. Um, the other thing I wanted to clarify, um, I just wanted to help and, and uh, maybe help everyone to understand um, what the work of content creation means. And the way I understand it, and uh, it, um, I'd appreciate if Representative Stevenson uh, could 
clarify this if, if he will yield. Representative Stevenson will yield. Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Stevenson, the way I understand the, the work of content creation definition, which really kind of triggers um, all of the other uh, regulation in the bill, to my understanding, is that it only applies in a situation in which um, there is a significant portion of the content creator, again, talking about someone who is over 18, um, their video produced in any 30-day period has 30% um, of a particular minor's uh, likeness, name, or photograph in that content. And there's also a, a threshold about how much money or the level of monetization that has to happen. And both of those things have to happen in order for that minor to be considered engaged in the work of content creation, which would trigger the ban for kids under 14, and then also the uh, requirements that they be, that, that, that um, a compensation be put into a, a, a trust fund. Um, and so I guess my, my next question would be, am I understanding that general framework uh, correctly? Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Niska. I think you did uh, describe it uh, accurately, yes. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Stevenson. And um, I guess two specific questions about that. The first would be, does that 30-day trigger um, then uh, result in uh, them being considered engaged in the co work of content creation for the for an entire 12 month period. That's the way I um, read uh, you know the language in 2.5 through 2.7. Um, Are you asking if, Representative Stevenson? If, re if to Representative yield. Stevenson will yield, thank you. He will yield, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Niska. I think that if at any point during the 12 months you're at, you meet that 30% uh, percent threshold or the, the financial threshold, then you're within the scope of, of the bill. I would agree with that. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Stevenson. And then the other question that I was uh, hoping you could, uh, you could enlighten us on with respect to that definition is um, there's a threshold an additional requirement that they um, receive compensation for video content equal to or greater than point than than one cent per view that's on line 2.16 and I just was curious I think we've talked about this some in a committee and I don't uh, know enough about how platforms uh, monetize content to understand can you give us some sort of sense about what type of an account or what level of monetization that refers to sort of in the real world? If Representative Stevenson will yield. Representative Stevenson will yield. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, speaker, thank you, Representative Niska. I don't have uh, statistics for you. I can't quantify the amount of, of people who um, uh, would, would meet that threshold. That threshold is clearly designed to separate the sort of incidental occurrence of making money from people who are doing it on a more systemic uh, level. So it takes it up a, a level of threshold. We're trying to not capture every person who ever posted something on the internet, right? So we have both the, um, the, the threshold of frequency and the, the financial threshold that shows some uh, significance. Um, I hope that's helpful. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Thank you, Representative Stevenson. Uh, I was hoping for something a little bit more specific, um, and, and maybe that's um, a topic for some further discussion down the road. Um, I guess the last question I would have, if uh, Representative Stevenson will yield. He will yield. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Stevenson, I was just curious, uh, just generally, how this would apply. I mean, there's a lot of talk about, um, in the athletics world, about name, image, and likeness. Um, endorsements. I, I'm just curious how this might apply to a high school student who has a name, image, and likeness um, uh, endorsement deal. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Niska. I think that in general, and you know, w without being an expert on name, image, and likeness uh, deals, I think a couple things are important to remember. One, of course, is that uh, as, as we were just discussing, the prohibition exists for people who are under the age of of 14, I don't know how many uh, kids under the age of 14 have name, image, image and likeness sponsorship uh, deals. I'm sure there, that, that does exist. Uh, and beyond that, there's uh, a protection. It's not that you can't engage in, in content creation uh, for money. It's that the money has to be set aside 
for your benefit later. So to the extent that name image and likeness deals somehow did get incorporated, were interpreted to be included in this, I, I think it would be appropriate to say that the kid should benefit uh, financially and that the money should be set aside. Having said all of that, um, I think it, to my mind, unlikely that a name image, image and likeness uh, agreement uh, would fall within the scope of this bill given uh, the, the definitional discussions that we're having about uh, content uh, creation and what uh, is involved in that. Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Stevenson, for that, um, for that conversation. And, and again, I, I, I want to uh, kind of circle back to where I started, which is um, I agree very much that this is a, a, a really serious issue. Um, we've talked a lot in this chamber, especially in the last few days, about um, protecting kids and prioritizing uh, protection of kids. And uh, there's obviously a, a, a real problem. Hopefully it's not a huge number of kids that are being exploited in this way, um, but there are some kids that are being exploited in this way. Um, and I, I do salute you for a, a real a good faith um, effort to try to deal with this. Um, I'm not sure that it's, I think it's probably a little over-inclusive and under-inclusive of the particular uh, problem that we're trying to deal with. Um, and I, honestly, I'm, I'm, I've been going back and forth today on whether uh, or not uh, to vote for this bill. Um, I think it's almost there. And I think uh, it's, 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 it's uh, I think it's a good start. And, you know, I, I do think we should move it forward today. Um, so thank you for the conversation, and like I said, thank you for, um, for this work on behalf of, the, uh, of kids in Minnesota. Thanks. I recognize the member from Meeker, Representative Gilman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little flip side of some positive things with uh, um, some folks in my district. I've got several, actually three families that I know personally that this is, their, um, this is their way of life. Um, one has five kids homeschooled, another one, um, I think they do kind of public school, and then another family is homeschooled family. But they have actually retired their husbands from their big time jobs and their big time insurance and all the things that comes with that, um, solely being online. <clears throat> and their, their children are a part of this business. So one um, is a DIY content creator um, who's gifted and has, has worked so hard to um, brand herself, you know, first through photography and then other, other means, and then just has kind of grown her platform. But um, I guess, like, when I'm looking at lines, you know, like the records required um, in 2.28 all the way to you know, into the threes, okay, <laughs> on down. My question is, uh, if um, the author would yield for a question here, when I'm looking at the, like on 3.1, the amount of content creation that generated compensation as described in a subdivision one during this period, um, how, my question is, is when it talks about the total number of minutes, um, they have to calculate the total number of minutes the minors in this content, um, and then compensation that's required. When it's, I'm just curious, like how would they be doing the recording of all this, and how would this be done, and who would govern this? That's my question. If, he will he yield, yield, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Gilman. So first of all, it's important to start at the top of subdivision two, which is the area that you were looking at, um, starting on line 2.28, which is all video content creators whose content features a minor engaged in the work of content creation shall maintain the following records. So that's important because you were referencing a friend who is having a DYI, um, DYI, yes, uh, uh, a channel, right? And if, if minors aren't involved in that, if they're not featuring their kids uh, on a basis um, consistent with what we were just talking about with Representative Niska, 30% of the time in a month over a 12-month period, or not making the amount of money, then these uh, record retention things don't apply at all. So if you're doing it and you don't have kids or you're not involving your kids, no impact on you. 
Um, the records are important for the purposes of establishing uh, the trust and how much money needs to go into the trust to meet the other requirements in there. And that's to make sure that if the kids are, um, uh, are, are working as influencers, that some amount of that money should flow uh, to their benefit. And you asked how that would be enforced or regulated. I don't think you said the word enforced, but, but that's why I understood your question to be. It's, there's no, um, uh, for the trust requirements, it's by a, a private right of action. That is, the child when they're 18 has a right to that money against uh, their, their parents if they did not set it aside, if that makes sense. Representative Gilman. Thank you so much. So the families that I'm speaking about, their children are an active role. They are an active part of this. Um, and that's my question is, is, you know, that's why I bring up what that question is because, I mean, even if it's them rolling out a rug um, on a reel or, or showing the books that they read or they're on vacation, and because their brand has grown so much, I mean, some of them are making over $100,000 a month. This is, this is big, this is big time money. This is, they've built their company, their business, they're making $100,000 a month, and their family is a part of the business. And so my, you know, I appreciate you kind of spelling that out. Um, so my question would be then, is if they are under that, I, I'm, I'm curious how they would have to, you know, like monitor all their content and scale it to see if they would be hitting that 30% or not. If, if in, in the grand scheme of things, they're already under law, child labor laws, things like that, I mean, that's already happening, and they're, and they're compensating their children and their family by, by affording the life that they have right now through their business. So my question is, is how would they monitor that to know if they were above that 30% or um, below here? I just didn't know if there was enough in there to, to spell that out. If you would... Representative Gilman, you're asking Representative Stevenson to yield. He will yield. Representative Stevenson. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Gilman. And you're, you're absolutely right. It is big time money, right? And it's important to note that for a lot of these content creators, the reason why it's big time money, the reason why they're able to get so much money is people want to see the kids, right? And there's all sorts of uh, stories out there. You can go and look at what that looks like for the kids, how their daily life is impacted. Even setting aside what we what was talking about in my opening remarks or what Representative Niska and I were talking about, the, the, the sexualization. But even just in the work of content creation, it is work, multiple takes of doing the same thing, whole days uh, uh, setting up a, an idea. Uh, and, and there's really um, compelling uh, narratives from people who have lived that life about what that was like in the child in childhood, because it is, it is work. You don't, no one pays you $100,000 a month to do just, you know, post a, a picture here or there. It's creating these whole uh, videos and everything else. And it's my belief that if a child is engaged in that work, that some of that money is theirs and shouldn't just be taken away by the parents and the managers. So your question is, what is that going to look like for the parent to make, to assess whether or not it's 30% uh, over, um, uh, a month-long period. I don't think that's an unreasonable thing for them to have to, to, to look at that, to look through the content they're posting and see, is the child on the screen more than 30% of the time when you look at the aggregate of uh, what they produce? And frankly, if someone's making $100,000 a month or even $10,000 a month doing uh, some, some, some work to document that and to comply with this law designed to protect the health and safety and well-being of children is not too much to ask, I don't believe. Representative Gilman. Thank you so much, and thank you for that, um, that answer. I appreciate it. That answers all my questions. Thanks. I recognize the member from Wright, Representative McDonald. Madam Speaker, uh, Representative uh, Stephenson, um, no, Stevenson, yes, we've had that debate in committee when you brought this to the floor, to the committee. And uh, on uh, the surface, uh, I was against it, uh, wasn't sure I could support it, but when we cited the New York Times article, uh, it alerted us to some of the challenges and some of the 
bad things that are happening. I also looked up many other articles from LA Times as well, indicating several things that uh, parents are taking advantage of in the filth and the bad actors, the bad behaviors, the immorality of families and how they could do that to their children uh, shows uh, a lack of character in what's happening in our society where morality is thrown out the window in the sake of the almighty buck and at the sacrifice of children, innocent children. So that, uh, getting at the root of that uh, is um, certainly must, we must do as lawmakers. Uh, but uh, like Representative Niska, I think uh, the bill is problematic at best. Um, personally, I think we as lawmakers need to be careful as we get into the homes of our family members and uh, tell parents and children what they can and cannot do uh, in making contact, content, and how much they should be distributing to their children and putting in a trust when uh, I'm aware of uh, representative, uh, many representatives who have um, cases in their district, such as I do. And um, one particular uh, influencer has many followers, 154,000 followers, and oftentimes she is compensated, or <laughs> this person is compensated by some goods that she, that this person uh, promotes. It's not always monetary. So in your bill, in looking through it and reading it since for the last month or so, how do you compensate for a content influencer who's receiving products that she's, he or she is promoting uh, with the use of their children as well? Um, it's, uh, how is that, uh, calculated in the language, and I believe it's not, and I'm just curious as your response to that, so if Representative Stevenson would yield for that question. He will yield. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, uh, Representative McDonald. So when we look at the trust uh, required uh, account, uh, what we're, or section of the bill, which starts on line 3.13, uh, paragraph A1, uh, starts to talk about if it's one minor, uh, the uh, amount that has to be set aside for the child relates to the gross earnings and any uh, video uh, segment. And so if you had non-cash uh, gifts, I think we would be talking about the, the value of those, I shouldn't say gifts, non-cash earnings, I think we'd be talking about the cash value of those earnings. Representative McDonald. Madam Speaker, well, there uh, in lies the difficulties of your bill because oftentimes a person who is receiving no cash but products by advertising those uh, is at wholesale or resale. Uh, so there's, there's many problems in that, in that section of the bill. So then what happens? Uh, the uh, content influence of the family member has to itemize and uh, put into a trust the what the resale the wholesale value of those products that they're using as a family to live on right uh, th i don't know how one would justify or account for such a thing and uh, matter of fact i don't think the law in your bill if this should become law would even um, you could even do that uh, i don't think that it puts in there any stipulation or protects if that's your intent to protect uh, families from um, uh, bad actors, if you will, because certainly you don't want to get involved in the families, such as Representative Gilman mentioned. Uh, three of her constituents uh, have their income to sustain the household. So in that respect, Representative Stevenson, and I just speak because I know that uh, the, the products are given or uh, received, not necessarily monetarily. Um, so those would not be included then in your bill if it should become law if you would yield for that question if I made any sense to you. He will yield. Representative Stevenson. Madam Speaker, Representative McDonald, I'm sorry, I didn't follow the, the question there, but I think, um, so I, I think what I understand your question to be is about, um, again, those, those non-cash things that someone might receive in compensation for their, their influencing, and those could range from being minor, they could be very, uh, very valuable things. And again, you know, my view, the view of the people who support this bill is that if a child is doing this work, if it has that impact on their lives, that they, that a portion of that value should go to their benefit, be set aside uh, for them. And I'm not sure that that's an answer to your question. I'm not, if you wanted to restate it, I, I would be willing to try again. 
Representative McDonald. Madam Speaker, no, I'll just make this point because it was made to me by my uh, friend who I work out with and who uh, has a content influencer or make, creates content and occasionally uses her children. I don't know if it's 30 percent or not. Uh, she's uh, concerned that uh, she'll have to keep track of that, of course, and the uh, period in time in which that minor appears in the footage in the first place. But um, she had grave concerns of, uh, so a family could receive X amount of dollars worth of products, and not, not cash products, uh, products. And then that person would have to itemize the products that they receive, and you calculate wholesale or resale, and then that, whatever the value is that, would have to be put in this trust according to your bill. I think that's, there's a, a very problematic in that scenario, and that's a real scenario uh, brought to me by a good friend and constituent in my community. So that's all I have for now. I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for a really good discussion here today, uh, members. Um, Representative Stevenson, I appreciate you trying to take this on. Um, you and I have had a couple of conversations about just the complexity of, of getting at the problems here, and I think you're really on the right track for the monetary piece and the child labor piece and all that. My concern is still with... Um, you know, the sexualization of the child and all that. And I'm wondering, um, and I can, I can give you some time to look at this, but or I, I'll just read the piece, because I, I did reach out to House Research on this. I'm like, what can we do? And it is just really sticky. Um, but I'm just wondering if, um, if you think under the definition of, well, it's, it's six, chapter 617.292, and it says this depicts a minor in a manner that is intended to appeal to the prurient interest in seeing a minor engage in sexual conduct. Do you think that that would cover the other aspect of this that we are trying to get at? Maybe it's already in statute and already illegal if a parent is out there trying to put sexualized images of their minor child out on these platforms. Representative Scott, are you asking Representative Stevenson to yield? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, I am. Representative Stephen will yield. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Scott. Uh, to answer your question, no, I, I don't believe that the existing laws, either against child pornography uh, or uh, the, the statute that, that you uh, quoted and the other provisions we have around child protection, are sufficient to cover uh, what is happening out there uh, regarding the sexual exploitation of, of children through uh, th this. There's a lot of tightrope walking uh, going on uh, here to people staying, trying to stay on, on the right side of the line. And this kind of goes to what Representative Niska and I alluded to when he talked about how difficult it is to draw um, a, a content line. So one question we had in, in committee, uh, I think from Representative Meckland was, you know, couldn't we more narrowly tailor this to try and just get at the objectionable content and not at content creation more broadly? And when you're talking about the First Amendment, anything that tries to splice out, this is the type of content that is acceptable and this is the type of content that is legal, generally falls afoul of the First Amendment. And so you need to take a, a more uh, content neutral approach uh, in order to survive that First Amendment scrutiny. But to get back to your question, I did speak to people who work in the child protection uh, area who work on uh, child trafficking, sex trafficking, uh, who talked about how helpful uh, this provision would be to protect uh, children uh, in the 21st century in the way that they are being exploited online. So I, I think this is actually necessary and that existing law isn't good enough. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, I look at even like one of the other suggestions was to maybe amend sexual, the definition of sexual harassment to include something like this. And I, I think there might be something there too, but um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna vote for the bill today. I think it's a good start. Um, and I think as time goes on, we'll find um, ways to address the concerns. We'll see how the bill performs legally and, and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, so much of this is just bad parenting, right? It's just. And, and it's, it's super hard to always um, nip that in the bud, but um, thank you for your efforts, and I'd be happy to work on this in the future. Thank you. I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and thank you to everyone that's um, asked questions and offered comments today. It's, it's been helpful. Um, and certainly, I appreciate uh, Representative Stevenson. It's probably been a month and a half or two months since we first talked about this issue and certainly shared our horror um, about the impetus for this, for this legislation. Um, and it is really difficult, and it is a really difficult issue. And I think what we're all trying to get at, right, the, and this is the sticky wicket, this is the problem we have, is that the problem we all have is this disgusting exploitation of children. That's a problem that every single one of us agrees on, and, and that's what we want to get at. Um, and, and frankly, I, I like and appreciate the provisions in the bill that, uh, that minors receive 30% of the, of the income. I, I, I think all of that is just fine. I am a little concerned about the expanse of this, of using child labor law as sort of the hook um, to be able to get it done. And, and again, I, I understand the sticky wicket, right? Like we got to find a way to get at this. Um, and as, as you indicated, I just said to somebody else over here, the problem we have is the First Amendment and, 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 and trying to attack content that's very difficult to do. Although I think Representative Scott is on to something, particularly when it comes to children. There, there are different standards, and so how can we maybe work with those standards? The piece that I'm actually most concerned about is, is the child labor piece, and, and that we are now saying that a, a child under 14, that this is now a working condition. Um, and, and I think about all the good wholesome stuff that's out there, right? And that, and that in order to get at this nasty stuff, we have to get at a whole lot of stuff that is actually pr pretty wholesome. I mean, frankly, when, when we all have our things, right? When I do my doom scrolling, it's typically families who have gone off grid and live in an RV, and that's how they spend their lives. That tells you where my mind is. Um, but that's a totally different scenario, right? Those, that's, those are families that have made these really fun um, choices for how they're going to live their lives that, um, that work for them. And could the families choose not to include any of their children under the age of 14 in those videos? Well, sure, they can choose that. Um, but there's also nothing inherently wrong with those kids being in those videos, right? Or, or to Representative Gilman's example of, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm a DIY family and my kids, they, they work with us all the time. And I think, I don't know, there's nothing objectionable about a five-year-old, a video of a five-year-old helping her family, you know, sweep a floor and roll out a rug or whatever it may be. Um, there's nothing inherently wrong or objectionable about that. Um, and yet, the way the bill is crafted now, it also has to sweep in all of that. Um, and, and that's where I'm really struggling with this. That's where I'm really struggling with it. Again, I think the co shared compensation is, is just and reasonable. Um, Certainly the goal of the bill to get at this really insidious, clearly disgusting exploitation of children um, is what we really want to do. And hopefully this would do that. Although I also, I also get a little concerned, you know, I mean, and Representative Niska brought this up, the, the, and, and you mentioned that for social media, uh, there's typically an age requirement. However, we also don't do age verification. And so it's happening all the time anyway. And absent age verification, that's not going to stop. I do think, just putting it on the record and on my way out the door, um, you know, I think the state of Utah did something really interesting when they put age verification on adult content. And guess what? Pornhub just left the state because it wasn't worth it to them. 
And frankly, if you are so interested in sharing your adult content with children, I got no problem with you leaving the state. Um, so it seems like there are things we can and should do. I, I do have concerns, and, and again, I recognize, we talked about this, you know, I mean, talking about the, the problem of figuring out what that hook is, right? And I'm just not sure we totally hit the mark with this um, in now completely prohibiting something that, that really is not, um, it's not done with malintent, it's not done to be harmful, nor is it harmful, right, in, in the vast majority of, of these kinds of cases that we're talking about. Um, and yet we're also prohibiting that. I, I think we, we still miss the mark a little bit on what that hook needs to be and how to protect these children without um, punishing families that really aren't doing anything wrong. So thank you for the work on this, Representative Stevenson. I recognize the member from Wright, Representative Hudson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, members, you know, we all know that a lot of the time we walk into this chamber knowing exactly how we're going to vote on bills. This is a scenario, this is a bill where the debate is influential. Came in inclined towards voting for it because of the sentiment of what it's trying to accomplish. The more we've talked about it here on the floor, the more convinced I am that it's a bad bill that does not accomplish what it's being sold as trying to accomplish. Um, I mean, we hear the stories, the horrific stories of sexual exploitation, the exploitation of children, but then we're presented with language that doesn't actually address that directly at all. It doesn't address it at all. All it does is it says, we're going to set some arbitrary limits and impose some arbitrary compensation. The number we've picked for reasons that I can't make make sense is 30%. 30% that as I read this, and I'm, you're welcome to correct me if I'm wrong, as I read this is 30% that's gonna be divided amongst any number of minors. So Representative Gilman gives the example of a family of five, presumably three children. If those three children, as I read this, in total exceed 30% of the content created, then we're going to mandate that those parents set aside 30% of their compensation into a trust fund that will then be split somehow between those kids. And I suppose that's why we're gonna, we're gonna go through the Herculean effort of tracking every minute that each child was in each video for future reference in case they decide to sue their own parents over it, which is a really odd thing to be trying to facilitate and encourage tension amongst families. Uh, and what this bill doesn't seem to take into consideration, you know, just the, the blanket assumption that any time children are involved in the creation of value with their family, and there are other examples that come to mind, farming has been raised in chatter over here, chores around the house. How about a lemonade stand on the side of the road? We used to see those, every once in a while I still do that any contribution, any value add that a child makes that benefits the household somehow doesn't benefit them? That we need to make sure, and we're gonna put a number on it, 30%. 30% of the compensation that's created as a result of that project is gonna be set aside for the kid. Well, why not? Maybe they're responsible personally for 50% of the value added. Maybe it was 15. How do we know? What, what objective criteria are we utilizing to make that judgment? I mean, the more I look into the details of what this bill does, the more arbitrary it feels, and the more it feels as though what we're actually accomplishing is just making ourselves feel good for having done something. In response to problems that aren't directly addressed by this bill. Now, if you'd have brought a bill to the floor today that 
specifically targeted the exploitative behavior that started off our discussion here tonight or this afternoon, I'd be all for it. And we should do that. We should be targeting and punishing parents who are engaged in the exploitation, the actual objective exploitation of their children. But the, the idea that we're, we're going to attack that problem through a civil process that provides their kids with the opportunity to sue them years from now when they turn 18, how is that protecting the kids? If they're being exploited, let's stop the exploitation today. And if that's really what we're trying to do, we should be targeting the bad behavior today, not providing a civil mechanism for a child to perhaps realize years later, oh my gosh, I think I might have been exploited. I should sue my parents over it. That seems like a really sloppy methodology for trying to solve the problem that was outlined at the beginning of this presentation. The more I talk about it, the more I'm leaning no, but I'm still open. You can convince me that this bill actually does do its job. Um, and I would welcome that. Thank you. To the author of the bill, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'll, I'll be brief because we have a big uh, agenda and just hope that it's um, compelling enough to convince Representative Hudson and others. Uh, the, um, to pick up where Representative Hudson uh, left off, uh, frankly, that's why the bill includes a ban on uh, kids under the age of 14 uh, doing this, uh, this work. And, and that is not uh, enforced. When we were talking about um, the civil right of action, that's with regard to the trust. And there was a conscious decision to not make that something that the Department of Labor or whatever else uh, enforces. But to just say, leave, we're just going to leave that as a civil right of action. Trust that most parents who are doing this are going to do the right thing, set some money aside. For the few who don't, the child has a, rec or the, the child has a recourse against their parents. With regard to the ban, that is enforceable by, uh, uh, by the Attorney General under, uh, under this bill. And it is, it is just saying it is not acceptable uh, for children under the age of 14 uh, to be engaged in this type of work. The potential for uh, exploitation and long-term harm is just too high. Um, uh, you ask why we can't more narrowly target uh, the specific behavior, and, and that was the discussion we had earlier, and, and Representative New Brindley said it. Uh, it is the First Amendment, uh, and, and uh, as uh, wonderful uh, as, as the First Amendment is and uh, free speech is, uh, it does present a difficulty when trying to get uh, at uh, the harms specifically involved uh, uh, from the phenomena of social media. Uh, you know, I have wrestled with that. Representative Robbins has wrestled with that. Uh, Representative Bonner, Representative Elkins, we've all been wrestling with how do you protect people while still respecting and complying with the First Amendment. And you have to stay content neutral in order to do that. And so my judgment after thinking about this and looking at this for a long time is that the harm is just too great for those young kids from uh, what we read about in the New York Times and other places. Uh, and I, there are things that have really nothing even to do uh, with sexual exploitation that also uh, will make your blood boil and your blood pressure go up. Uh, there's some really reprehensible things that people are doing with their children to make money on the internet. It should stop, and that's the approach that the bill uh, takes. So appreciate the good discussion today. Ask for a green vote. Thank you. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. <clears throat> Carol. Okay, here you go. Carol, yes. Carol I. Howard. Howard I. Howard I. Cagle. Cagle I. Cagle I. The clerk will close the roll. There being 103 yeas and 26 nays, the bill is passed and it's titled agreed to.
The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 3911. The clerk will report the bill. House file number 3911, number three on the calendar for the day, an act relating state government, the second engrossment. To the author of the bill, the member from Dakota, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's another great day to plant trees. Uh, and this is the Environment and Natural Resources Supplemental Finance and Policy Bill. The budget target for the general fund was $17 million. Uh, increase. The bill also makes various appropriations in dedicated accounts. It builds on last year's historic investments in the environment, protecting our environment and our natural resources. It supplements those investments and helps rebalance some of those investments. Before I start, I want to make sure I thank our committee staff, Janelle Taylor and Bob Eliff from House Research, Fiscal Analyst Brad Hagemeyer, Revisor Cindy Maxwell, Committee Administrator Peter Strohmeyer, and Committee Ad Legislative Assistant Sam O'Neill, Partisan Researchers Chelsea Ray and Amy Zipko. We would not be able to do this without your help and de dedicated work for the people of Minnesota. As I mentioned, this bill uh, supplements last year. One of the areas where we had proposed a large investment uh, in last year's bill was in trees and planting a tree is one of the most important things we can do to protect our environment. This bill appropriates over $19 million for trees. It also protects air quality. Prevention is better than cleanup. Prevention is better than cleanup. This bill provides stronger protections for residents of environmental justice areas. It creates an air pollution prioritization and compliance protocols in the seven county metro area and provides increased enforcement and penalties for repeat offenders. Solid waste is a big problem in our state and this bill addresses our solid waste program problem. It takes major steps to address that with extended producer responsibility or EPR. Packaging waste and printed paper now account for roughly 40% of our, of our garbage. Just south of me in Dakota County, what used to be a landfill is now a mountain. Our, our garbage is literally growing and we can see it in front of us. Other highlights, we protect pollinators. Provides over a million dollars for nation leading popular lawns to legumes program. And it designates the rusty patch bumblebee as an endangered species in Minnesota. It protects the dedicated accounts for landfill cleanup notifying those counties where the landfills are if there are future raids. It provides additional protection for our waters. Looking at the issue of nitrates, we take action with our state properties. We require the DNR to monitor water quality at our various state fish hatcheries and clarifies DNR's rulemaking authority around shorelands. For, if you listen to nothing else, one part of this bill is a reason enough to vote for it, and that is helium. We currently do not have any regulations set up in our state for the extraction of helium. That means that people can and companies can come in and take the helium without any consequence, without any regulation. We have to have some support, something to protect the resource of people of Minnesota and in this bill, we have that framework. We provide a moratorium on extraction while we work out those details and involve a public process to protect Minnesota's resources for helium and other gases. And then finally, this is a bipartisan bill. We have at least three provisions in here from the GOP. We have a Thank you, Madam Speaker. We promote small businesses by allowing the sale of bear fat products from Representative Nathan Nelson. We extend a provision to help clean up French Lake and Rice County from Representative Daniels. And we have a report on reopening the General C.C. Andrews State Nursery by Representative Dotseth. And that, Madam Chair, I will take questions. There are amendments at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. 
Hansen R. moves to amend House Bill number 3911, the second engrossment. The amendment is coded A14. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Hansen, who will explain the amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is the A14 amendment. Uh, what it does is it uh, brings us into the same type of uh, structure as we had with cumulative impacts last year with the air quality monitoring and uh, protection. It, it limits that to the seven county metropolitan area. In addition, uh, it updates uh, the community tree planning, environmental justice definitions, so they more closely align to what we had passed last year. Uh, and then it also uh, uh, updates that with census tract information. So it takes out uh, a provision relating to ATVs on signage, and that is the A14 amendment. I'd ask for your support. Discussion to the amendment. Representative Nash, are you standing to be recognized or are you just hanging out? Okay. Uh, there being no discussion on the amendment, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. Aye. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Davis moves to amend House Bill number 3911, the second engrossment, as amended. The amendment is coded A20. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Fillmore, Representative Davis. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you to the author of this bill, Representative Hansen. Uh, so this amendment um, just is, it's gonna give our law enforcement all across the state, our sheriffs, it's going to give them a win at a time that they really need a win. Um, so currently, when our sheriffs, our brave sheriff's departments, go out and do a search and rescue, uh, someone goes out on a lake, they need to get saved. Uh, right now in statute, they can get a partial reimbursement uh, for going out and doing that. Uh, and the reason for that is many times, like in my uh, county I live in, Crow Wing County, um, we've got a lot of lakes, and we get a lot of people coming from all over the state or even out of the state, not necessarily from Crow Wing County, and they find themselves in these situations where they need a rescue. And so it would make sense that the state would give them a partial reimbursement uh, for being brave and doing their job. And so that happens uh, until the water freezes, folks. When the water freezes and our sheriff's departments have to do a search and rescue, when the conditions are even more dangerous, we then don't reimburse them as a state. This amendment is going to fix that. It's going to line it up with the water rescues. I'll read a portion of this here. It says a county sheriff may be reimbursed for all costs that are over and above the county sheriff's regular operating budget and that are inc incurred from search and rescue operations due to recreational activities on unsafe ice. So please vote green members. Let's help out our sheriffs. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I would support the amendment. Further discussion? There being no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Heinzman moves to amend House Bill number 3911. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A15. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Crow Wing, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, and uh, that is my amendment. I I'm hoping that we have an opportunity to move this amendment forward. Um, I'll just quickly mention that uh, even though I'm in a tree industry, that I'm very proud to point out that I have planted many, many uh, thousands of trees personally. I love to uh, work on legislation. I appreciate the legislation and the spirit of what um, we're doing in this bill. Uh, anytime we could have more trees, that's great. My concern and the reason I am putting this amendment forward uh, is that I want to specifically address the earmarks. So this, this amendment 
deletes the earmarks in the new community tree planting grant program. Absent that, I feel like we'd have a really good final product. And uh, that's why I have brought the amendment forward today. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would ask that you oppose the uh, amendment. Uh, the amount of money going to Northfield. Northfield actually straddles uh, two counties. Uh, and so uh, it, it wouldn't, this is a particular grant that is going out uh, through the Metropolitan Council. In addition, uh, in previous grants through the DNR, uh, there was extra points for communities that were under 20,000 people, and Northfield's population is 20,500. So that is why we put that in there with the city of St. Peter. St. Peter, uh, if you may remember, uh, about 25 years ago had a tornado. A lot of trees went down with that. They were replanted with ash trees. And so the needs in St. Peter are somewhat unique. And so that's why we have those particular earmarks. I would ask for a no vote on the Heinzman Amendment. Any further discussion on the amendment? There being no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. Madam Chair. The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Jacob moved to amend House Law number 3911, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A18. To the author of the amendment, the member from Winona, Representative Jacob. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to start by requesting a roll call vote. A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Well, thank you. So what my amendment really seeks to do is to retain a many decades old program that, give you a little bit of background, the state has allowed farmers to plant corn and other crops on state land dating as far back as when the state originally purchased the land. So in my neighborhood, myself, my family, and my neighbors, came around the late 1800s. The DNR came in in the 1940s and proposed to purchase a lot of farmland and create, in, in my area, the Whitewater State Park. And in order to get the farmers to sell that property to the state, the farmers didn't want to sell. So the, the DNR and the state said, well, we'll allow you to continue to farm that property and in lieu of paying for the land, we'll ask that you leave one third of your crop for the wildlife. So this became a really good program for the farmers, for the hunters, for the DNR, but mostly for the wildlife. So you've got middle of the winter, deer are ha having a very hard time finding food to eat. And how this program works when you leave a third of your crop, you don't just leave a third in one area, you have to leave six rows, then you can take 12 rows, then you leave six rows. So this really helps with the wildlife. And by not having this program, the deer will have no place to go other than on private property. So this really, and my farm 90% surrounded by the DNR as many of my fellow neighbors are. I've seen herds as large as 70 deer roaming across my field, eating my crops, and for the DNR to not even make an attempt to try to feed their animals. In committee, I asked the author, who's asking for this? Is it the farmers? Is it the hunters? Is it the DNR? And he said, no, no one's asking for this. He said, this is my idea. So in order for the state, DNR, farmers to all get along, this is a, this is a good program. My amendment seeks to eliminate this prohibition on planting corn. And so I encourage a green vote, thank you. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, 
I know on a, on a Wednesday afternoon, not everybody wants to read a fiscal note, uh, but I would encourage you to look at the fiscal note on House File 3624. That is the bill that Representative Jacobs was referencing. And I want to give a little bit of context in terms of public land versus private land. You know, we have invested, and I'll go back to the bill from last year, we invested $21 million of general taxpayers' money into soil health. $21 million for soil health for voluntary practices, voluntary conservation practices on private land. Private land, where we try to encourage those voluntary practices. But there is land that we all own, all of us together, that public land. And I think most Minnesotans would be surprised to learn that we have 12,035 cultivated acres of DNR land. Now, we often get ac accused, or the agencies get accused, le legislators get accused of one hand not knowing what the other hand is doing. Now, we have the public trust, the public responsibility for dealing with that public land. And we have heard here for many years the issues related to climate change and the benefits of trees, the benefits of native grasses, the benefits of native education, vegetation. In addition, we start to see scientific research that shows that maybe food plots weren't a great idea. Maybe they draw a lot, uh, wildlife to crops. That old mentality of planting food crops for the livestock, for the wildlife, for the wildlife. Wildlife are not livestock. And so by having diversity, biodiversity on our public lands, that biodiversity actually leads to strength and balance with ecology. Ecology is a word that we don't often use anymore, but it means things going into balance. So the DNR has cooperative farming agreements and agricultural leases. That means they are renting that land out, renting our land out to grow corn. In the last year, we've also heard about nitrates in water. When you're growing corn, you're using fertilizer, you use the fertilizer in certain areas, that timing, rate, and application lead to contamination of groundwater and surface water. So planting native vegetation, planting trees, taking the public land and putting into a public purpose of having those type of plants growing on it leads to diversity in wildlife. It lessens the impact of deer. It lessens the impact of other wildlife. So there are multiple benefits for transitioning these public lands off from corn leases. There are benefits to the public in terms of better water, better biodiversity, better wildlife, and hopefully helping mitigate impacts of climate. Now it's going to cost money because there's going to be lost revenue. And we provide for that. It does cost money in the short run, but in the long run it saves us money and it saves us an impact relating to habitat and water quality. So I'd ask for a no vote on the Jacob Amendment. Representative Jacob. Representative Anderson. Yes, thank, you. thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, excellent point raised by my seatmate, Representative Jacob. I've seen firsthand some of the damage that the deer do in, in fields. And I'll tell you, if a deer has a choice between some dry old grass in the fall or a nice cob of corn standing on a stock, he's going to go to the corn. Corn is an excellent feed, high in energy. And by the way, corn is a perfect solar panel, taking in CO2 and giving off oxygen. But um, we heard in Ag Committee last year, uh, soybean farmers 
saying that their fields, especially in southeast Minnesota, were being, in some areas, decimated by, by deer. And if we don't do something to curb those losses, we're going to be looking at uh, bills to provide depredation damage to soybean farmers, corn farmers, because these are the state's deer herd and causing significant damage into the thousands of dollars into soybean fields we heard in committee last year. So I support the Jacobs Amendment. It's common sense. We've done this for years. Sometimes there were agreements made, maybe handshakes, that uh, if I sell you the land, you can keep growing corn on it. But we don't want to go backwards in terms of allowing depredation by, by our wildlife in Minnesota. So please support the Jacobs Amendment. Further discussion on the amendment? To the author of the amendment, Representative Jacob. Would the author of the bill yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Jacob. So the bill appears to prohibit planting corn. Could those acres be planted to barley, wheat, any other grain? Or is it or is that really a what is the true intention of the bill? To pull this land out of production entirely or to take it um, prohibit planting corn? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Jacob. Uh, it says planting corn. Uh, that you could plant, as you know, you could put a small grain in and then transition into alfalfa. Uh, that transition over time, hopefully, and we put the money in to, to plant in native grasses and trees. Representative Jacob. Will the author of the bill yield to another question? He will yield. Representative Jacob. So if the land could be planted to something other than corn, why is there $3.1 million in the bill to transfer that land into trees and native grasses? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Jacob. The prohibition is on corn. The preference is on the native grasses and the trees. We want to make sure we have the money to try to encourage that. It is unlikely that that is going to occur over one year or even two. It's a transition. Representative Jacob. Okay, well, I'll just remind people the way the plan stands, good for the farmers, good for hunters, good for the DNR. Most importantly, it feeds our wildlife and keeps the wildlife from being predators on our crops. Please support my amendment. Further discussion on the amendment. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Speaker. I, I would, too, uh, speak in favor of this amendment. And there, there was a, quite a conversation in committee about this issue. And I feel like uh, there is some missing context for those watching at home and for members potentially. This issue doesn't just start and end in a timeline that you might, you might think. Like, it is not an emerging discussion or issue. This goes, this goes way back. And there were many that have, uh, have spoken and shared their feelings on this over the years. And we're just, I guess, uh, addressing many of those, those long conversations and making sure that those agreements are honored in this amendment. Making sure that, that we continue to um, remember our promises. And I want to make sure that uh, I spoke and rose to this and asked for a green vote on the Jacob Amendment. Further discussion? Representative Lawrence. Madam Chair, thank you. Day 15. Um, say, I want to speak in favor of this amendment as well. I have the privilege of having the Sherburne County, Sherburne National Wildlife Refuge partly in my district as well. And I watch as they have used numerous different management techniques in all different parts of that National Wildlife Refuge. Once again, I look at this as being something that's micromanaging. 
We've had discussion about education over the last few days, about micromanaging our school boards and our principals and our superintendents. I believe this is a far-reaching STEM as well. We've got DNR personnel have been hired to manage those areas. And as I've watched over the years, our refuge is beautiful. It's gone through numerous transitions. Um, and its, it's type of managements have changed many, many different times over the years. And so as, as I speak in favor of this amendment, because we practice, we, we talk about practicing emphasizing best 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 method practices best practice best there we go. thank you <laughs> i defer <laughs> but best management practices and we need to take into all considerations what are those best management practices and so i speak in favor of this amendment it's a good thing there's a lot of factors that come from it and the biggest part is it leaves the options open for the different areas of our state the different um properties that are public private that are state open and for our DNR officials to use what's best for the area and more specifically for the specific spot that they're managing. And so please vote in favor of the amendment. Further discussion to the A18 amendment. Seeing none, oh, excuse me, Representative Johnson. I too rise in favor of this amendment. This is an important amendment. Not only is it an agreement made when the land was purchased, and some of it was purchased under duress from the ag industry and the farmers in those communities. In my years as a deputy sheriff, I'd drive around, I'd see the state land with the corn on it, I'd see it with the beans on it. And the wildlife, not only the deer, but it was the turkeys and all sorts of other animals would come to those. In the spring, when the ducks and geese were migrating north, they'd be stopping at those fields to eat. It was good for all wildlife. But I've also seen the land, because I actually have part of Cedar Creek and the university in my area, where they didn't do the crop rotations and have the crops on the land. You didn't see much for any type of wildlife on that land. They'd walk through, but they wouldn't stay there. This is a program that's good for the wildlife. It's good for the farmers. It's good for DNR. And what's more interesting is DNR did not want this. Ag industry did not want this. Nobody wanted this. And what was more concerning to me was the response by Representative Hansen that showed that his goal was to end any use of that land for agriculture. Agriculture is a huge industry in this state. DNR and this, and this state has purchased so much land over the last 20 years, it's ridiculous. We have more land than we can manage. When we, and with the farmers using that land, rotating their crops from not just corn, but there's beans, there's alfalfa, there's rye, there's oats, they rotate it. It's better for that land. Members, please vote green on the on this amendment. Further discussion to the A18 amendment. The author of the amendment, Representative Jacob. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I asked the author if the land could be planted to something else, if it simply prohibited corn. He said, yes, it could be planted to something else. It could be planted to barley, wheat, whichever. But the language on 73.29 says, the commissioner must transition all existing corn plots into native, native vegetation. So, and then the author goes on to say that this increases diversity. Seriously, you're going to remove something that's available for the deer to eat? Give the DNR one less tool, give the farmers one less tool, give the hunters one less tool? and that's going to increase diversity, that's less diversity. So please support my amendment. 
Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the A18 amendment. Seven is the number we want to be at. We're there, so let me know. Yep. The clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 62 ayes and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> New Brindley moves to amend House Law number 3911, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A16. The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, uh, this amendment simply removes a swimming pool that is being paid for through the Outdoor Recreational Opportunities for Underserved Communities account. It's just not an appropriate use of that account, and I would request a green vote. Discussion to the A16 amendment. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I understand this is a voice vote. Uh, I am going to be opposing it, but members are free to vote as they wish. Further discussion to the A16 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. No. The motion prevails and the amendment has been adopted. To seeing no further amendments, the, bill, the clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House Bill number 3911, as amended. Third reading, discussion to the bill. The member from St. Louis, Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the bill has some good stuff and not so good stuff. That's a typical bill. One of the good things in it is the helium. It's in my district, the people I represent, the area I represent. We have an opportunity to support this. And it's a great part of this bill. Uh, it will support, it sets a, uh, uh, priorities on the regulation of this new gas, something Minnesota does not have anything in the books on. So the DNR and PCA, we're all working together to find that um, management so we can do this extraction. So that's a great thing. I can't say enough about how good that is. Um, helium is a important element for us in our society. Uh, those in here that go to the doctor and get MRIs, helium is part of it. Uh, those that use computers here, uh, it's made chips. Helium is, uh, helps make a chip. S and, and, yeah, and some of the things that we, some of the folks who helped support this bill were uh, the MCEA, the Minnesota Center for Environmental Act advocacy, and also Friends of the Boundary Waters, normally in, in our part of the world, a nemesis. But we're working together because I think everyone is see, sees when you work together, you get further ahead. And that's what we're trying to do. Now, unfortunately, there's some things in this bill that I have a hard time supporting. Um, the representative I think it was Representative Kraft had the, the, the boat. I'm trying to find it here, one second. The boat wrap product. G um, fantastic idea. Uh, sitting around one day with a, a group watching that stuff come off a boat, it's like, where does that go? Yeah, where does it go? And you start adding it up, it's huge. It's, a, it's, a, it's definitely an issue. Before we roll it out to the whole state, we talked about this in committee. 
I would love to see it as a pilot project in the area where the uh, recycling is done. Because if all of northern Minnesota has all of it and we can't recycle it up there, how much energy and how much um, and environmental degradation does it take to move it from there to down here? So I, I think it's worthy, it's absolutely worthy of looking at what to do. I don't think it's ready for a statewide rollout. Um, other, other issues in here that I kind of have uh, some, some issues with were uh, the, the feedlots, those, those are all good. Uh, the corn planting state land, not good. Um, the trapping restrictions. One, one of the issues with the trapping restrictions, in northern Minnesota, we have a lot of public land, but there's also some private land near the public land. And it, sometimes you the water, ordinary high water mark, you go over private land to get to public land. So there's a lot of questions that come up with this bill. I think it needs to be vetted better. I think it needs to a little more work. My goal here is I hope um, um, that, that we can work some of these issues out in conference. Uh, Packaging and Waste Reductions Act. Again, uh, just a, a, a great idea, but it went from an idea to something really big right away, and I, and I think it needs some vetting. I think we need to look at that. It, it kind of fundamentally changes the way we collect waste uh, with the e-waste. Not saying it's not a bad idea, I'm just saying it collects a lot of money and puts it in, in a different place that we're not sure what exact product is going in there. Um, other than that, I, I, it's, again, for me, it's the helium bill that's really important. Unfortunately, there's enough in here that I can't support it right now. I'm hoping when it comes back from conference committee, it is going to have something in there that I can support. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Roseau, Representative Burkle. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So this bill has uh, numerous provisions that are bad for business and bad for farmers. Um, thankfully, our outdoor enthusiasts are going to be happy that this ATV language has been fixed. Um, the north of Highway 2 language that uh, Chair Hansen's um, amendment took out is very much appreciated by the folks back north, especially my hunters and trappers. Um, also, the ATV account money for the trails, uh, very appreciative of that. Um, there's really no need to change uh, this, this Highway 2 language. Uh, the DNR currently can classify land. Uh, first land is closed, limited, or managed regarding uh, the use of off-highway vehicles. So I was glad to see that provision um, disappear from the bill. Um, Section 30 of the bill, which addresses the mandatory environmental impacts statements for large livestock prop projects, um, very problematic for our, for our livestock industry. Minnesota already has a solid environmental review process, as well as specific requirements for feedlots starting at 300 animal units or more, um, and additional requirements for feedlots of 1,000 animal units or more. And these requirements already include a manure management plan, public notice, emergency disaster plans, and engineered construction plans. Um, these manure management plans, for instance, give livestock farmers the direction they need to apply manure in a responsible way that reduces an imp any impact to groundwater and delivers a high quality alternative to commercial fertilizer for farmers to grow their crop. In particular, if you're an organic fan, you should be very happy to have manure spread on your land. The existing permit process also contains a framework for environmental assessment worksheets to be completed. And once the feedlot completes an EAW, the MPC can evaluate and determine whether they need to have an EIS. So there's just no need for this, this 10,000 animal unit language in the bill. Um, I do want to thank Chair Hansen for his, his work on the feral hog issue. Um, I've shared my pictures on my phone with him and, and some others in the room. We are seeing feral hogs across the border now in Kitson County in particular. Um, I think there's more work to be done on that in Article 6, but, but it's a good start. Um, and, I, and I look forward to working more on the feral hog issue with Chair Hansen. Um, also specific to my district um, is the elk management plan and changes to it. 
Um, and unfortunately, those prop proposed changes that are on section 38, page 66 in the bill, really disregard the concerns of folks back home in my district in Northwest Minnesota. Removal of this elk management plan language essentially grants the DNR the ability to grow the elk herds, completely disregarding my farmers and ranchers in, in uh, Kitson County in particular. Um, increasing the size of this elk population without additional compensation for the landowners and the farmers involved creates an undue financial burden for those folks. And by striking previous land language, local cattle and grain farmers' voices are really, really being ignored. For reference, and I, and I wish I had the numbers passed out to you on your desks, but Department of Ag, who handles the depredation account for, for wolves and elk, which transfers between each account, um, they've already transferred $33,000 from the wolf account to the elk account as we speak. So they're already in a situation where they're short about $90,000 to, to pay elk claims in Kitson County and in Marshall County, and they won't be able to pay those claims until fiscal year 25. So they're, they're expecting to run out of money early in fiscal year 25. Northwest Minnesota County uh, grain, cattle grain and cattle farmers should not bear the burden for growing the elk herd. And I want to thank Chair Vang for, for her assurances that this depredation issue will be corrected in our Ag Committee going forward. Um, beyond that, you know, I think in committee we, we address this at some degree, but if you turn to Article 7 in the bill under the miscellaneous section, there's some troubling, and I, and I did, this did come up in committee and I asked Chair Anson about it. I'm not going to ask him to yield today. Um, but if you look at sections 1, 2, and 3, in particular, sections that are all written to ag statute don't belong in this environment bill. Um, section one addresses pesticide treated seed. It should be in, it should be in 21, if I remember correctly. It's written to section 18B in statute. Pesticide seeded tree, nitrogen inhibitors in, in section two and section three, um, which provide definitions for systemic pesticide. All those provisions really don't belong in this bill. Um, so with that, and with all the other problems I, I see in the bill that, that Representative Scrab already outlined, um, I'd ask you for a no vote. Thank you. The member from Winona, Representative Jacob. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Between running for county commissioner and house representatives, I've run four campaigns based on stopping the expansion of government. And this bill does something just exactly the opposite. It penalizes hardworking Minnesotans and discourages businesses from considering moving here. A few of the provisions in this bill include an increase in ag-related penalties raised by more than 300% from $25,000 per day to $75,000 per day. Another increase in penalties of 700% from $10,000 to $70,000. And here's my favorite, and by favorite I mean I can't believe this, an increase in a penalty of 4,000% from $500 to $20,000. And you might think, well, some of these industrial organizations or big companies or commercial outlets, maybe they deserve a $20,000 penalty. But this $20,000 penalty is for farmers, including small organic farmers who might only have five or 10 acres, and they plant one foot too close to a stream bed. So this is planting a crop on property they own themselves and are paying taxes on. And may have, this might have been a mistake on their part, or stream beds move. You get a heavy rain, 
it washes out one side of the bank and it deposits it, deposits the soil on the other side of the bank. $20,000 for a, it'd be like a $20,000 penalty for going 56 in a 55 mile an hour speed zone. And I've sat on just as many of these water resource boards as I could for the last 12 years on the county board. We've done everything we can to encourage farmers to come into the ASCS office, NCRS office, SWCD. But when they start hearing about a $20,000 penalty for a violation that one of these offices would have control over, they're not going to come in anymore. They're going to just try to be as divorced from the government as they possibly can be. Other provisions in the bill, it requires EISs on large dairies that will cost clearly hundreds of thousands of dollars and drive businesses to neighboring states. And the bill raids the taxpayers' bank accounts in what I'd consider to be unethical ways. The bill includes $1.3 million for the Lawns to Legumes program, $5.5 million to the PCA, another $3 million to the PCA for environmental justice areas, more than a million for a mobile emissions trailer, $1 million for lawn equipment and snow removal, making those equipment electrified, $1.3 million to the DNR for legal costs, $4 million to the DNR for tree planting, and the $3.1 million to convert corn plots into tree plantings, $12 million to the Met Council, more than $200 million for modernizing outdoor experiences. I'm sorry, but at the end of the day, this bill simply pits the DNR against farmers, it pits small farmers against large farmers, and it pits neighbor against neighbor. Please vote no. The member from Ramsey, Representative Finke. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and Chair Hansen for your bill. Um, I rise today to speak uh, for trees. I just want to thank the author for the inclusion of the tree planting funds that we have in this bill. Um, we needed to make some up after last year. I'm excited for what we got in this bill. I'm excited for what we have in other bills. Um, and I just wanted to take a second and just talk for a second about trees because I love trees and I love legislating for trees. So um, well, one thing we know about trees in Minnesota is that we have the emerald ash borer, which is coming for our trees. Um, we have a billion ash trees in Minnesota. I don't know if people realize that. That's billion with a B. We actually have 15 billion living trees in Minnesota. I find that just astonishing. It's very hard to scale that. Most of those ash trees, most of 30% of the ash, the trees in the metro area, the Seven County Metro, 30% are ash trees. Um, our communities are losing a lot of trees, and it's a real problem. We know that trees are good for the air. They are the lungs of the planet, as uh, was recently said to me. But I also just wanted to make sure people know the other reasons that we need to plant these trees, especially here in our urban areas and in our environmental justice areas. So in case you don't know, trees lower the temperature. They decrease anxiety. If you, have, if you live in an area with tree canopy, they decrease anxiety, they decrease psychological stress, they increase attentiveness and cardiovascular function, they increase social cohesion, and they decrease crime. We also know that black and brown communities in the United States, and this is true in Minnesota, have 33% less tree cover than white communities, and high poverty communities have 41% less tree cover than wealthy communities. So we need to plant trees. We need to plant them for every environment and climate reason that we know. Um, but, but we also all benefit 
from trees in ways we don't even understand. And when we lack trees, we may not understand that that's part of what we're missing, but we need to make sure the benefits of trees are being equitably distributed to every Minnesotan. Thank you. The member from Washington, Representative Anderson. Or, uh, I'm sorry, the representative from Pope, Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, from Duluth. Anyway, um, I'm uh, on the Ag Committee, and I'm, I'm I'm really surprised at all of the the issues in this environmental bill that that really have a direct impact on agriculture. I could go down the list: uh, corn planting ban on state land, increase in fees of buffer violations, mandatory EIS on large feedlots, soil health grants. Representative Burkle mentioned some of the uh, statutes that really are ag statutes but are in this bill. I'm going to talk on one other issue in, in this bill that really impacts ag again, and that has to do with, with the uh, tile, what I call tile registry language in this, in this bill that seems to be, again, to be another, another program where it's going to be a fee and another application to fill out and uh, go to Bowser or your SWCD. And really, I have to ask myself, is it necessary? I mean, when most people buy cropland or farmland, having tile is a, is a positive thing. And I talked to the realtor back home in town, and he gave me this form. It's from the Minnesota Realtors Transition. It's 12 pages that has to be filled out with a whole, whole host of questions, instructions to buyer, instructions to seller. Is this information disclosed to the best of the seller's knowledge? Any current past phase one, phase two, or three environmental site issues? And here we go on page three. Is the property located in a drainage district, county, or judicial drainage system? Is the property drain tiled? It's already here, folks, in disclosure that's being filled out by buyer and seller? Is there a private drainage system on the property? Is the property located within a government designated disaster evacuation zone, nuclear facility, hazardous chemical facility, or a waste facility? Any drainage issues, flooding or conditions conducive to flooding? Any settling, erosion, soil movement problems affecting the property? any gravel pits, sinkholes, caves, mine shafts, or others affecting the property. I think we have that topic pretty well covered, members. I don't think there's a need for that in, in state statutes. And my last comment is uh, Chair Vang on the floor. Yeah, she is. Thank you, Chair Vang. Just a quick question to you. There's a lot of things in this bill that, that really refer to ag policy, and Representative Burkle mentioned a couple of issues, uh, Section 18, pesticide treated seeds, Section 21, systemic pesticides. I think those were in the ag bill we passed out of your committee last year and were taken out in conference. So my question, would the Chair Vang yield to a question, Madam Speaker? She will yield. Representative Anderson. Chair Vang, just a quick question to you. Being all of these issues in this environment bill relate to ag, or a lot of the issues relate to your bill, which we're going to be hearing later today, I, I, I hear. Were you ever asked to have some of these things heard at your committee, specifically regulations about pesticide-treated seeds, systemic pesticides, or a big increase in fines on buffer zone infractions? Were you ever asked to hear some of those things in the ag committee? Chair Vang. Representative Vang. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Anderson, for your question. Uh, the issue of uh, pesticides, uh, in, currently in uh, Representative Hansen's bill on environment, uh, they are only definitions. We, last session, we have heard uh, related languages relating to um, programming, such as verification of need or pesticide regulation, and knowing how those are much more regulatory uh, programs that they also did not make it into law, did not make it into the final conference bill. Uh, but 
have been issues that we've discussed uh, for a number of years already. So they're not new issues, um, and we've heard them before. And so I think uh, this year in, uh, in the Environments Bill, with just the definitions, there are no, not uh, uh, extensive language as we've heard last year. And so I think it is a reasonable uh, language that we can uh, come to a consensus with this year. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Chair Vang. I agree that they are only definitions, but uh, sometimes they are just the, uh, the building blocks, the foundation of things that uh, will come later on down the road. So again, Madam Speaker and members, I too would voice my opposition to the bill, mainly based on some of the negative things that are going to impact agriculture. Uh, we mentioned those before, but um, thank you for allowing me to speak on the bill, and I would recommend a no vote as well. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thanks to all of my colleagues who voiced concerns with this bill. Uh, there's a lot of concerning things found within this bill, but the other thing that needs to be mentioned is what's not in this bill. Throughout the, the, the course of the last uh, two years, there's been opportunities to talk about proper wildlife management, proper wildlife management of all of the species. Uh, as we've heard, uh, the, the contents of this bill are actually going to have a more devastating impact upon proper wildlife management in this state. There's been an overpopulation of countless species, uh, especially uh, wolves. The deer population has been radically changed, and there hasn't been any conversation, any hearing, any debate in the House of Representatives about the things that impact our outdoor heritage, and our hunting heritage here in Minnesota. These populations are greatly impacted by weather and climate. They're impacted by agriculture policy and especially environmental policy. And while Democrats have had the DFL trifecta here in St. Paul, there have been no hearings no discussions, no conversation, no compromise, and no input from Minnesotans as to the wildlife populations in Minnesota. This is important because the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources is inadequately hearing the voices of hunters and outdoorsmen and women across the state. The wolf management plan that came into place in 2023 didn't receive any amount of scrutiny from the House of Representatives. We haven't taken up any additional conversation or debate that is impacting the deer population throughout the vast majority of the state. Democrats, Republicans, independents, and people who don't vote care about our outdoor and hunting heritage. And yet with inaction from this legislature, wildlife populations are out of control. We aren't seeing proper wildlife management practices happening in our state. And the negative impacts are vast and wide. Throughout large swaths of northern Minnesota, people who have hunted for generations in the North Woods are no longer seeing deer. And the reason that this is happening is because of an overpopulation of wolves, among other, uh, among other circumstances. But the things that are within our control in this body, this body did not hear. And because of that, the next generation will have fewer opportunities to hunt the woods, to enjoy the outdoors, because these populations will cease to exist in key portions of the state. The wolves are so rampant across large swaths of Minnesota that the deer populations continue to be pushed further and further and further and further south.
the result of this inaction and improper wildlife management is that there are long time generational deer hunters who this fall don't even plan to hunt. And their voice hasn't been represented here at the legislature during the complete DFL control of state government. And it's irresponsible. Now was the time for action. Now was the time to take a positive first step to managing our wildlife populations and to hold the DNR accountable because it's their actions that have resulted in devastation for our hunting and outdoor heritage. Proper wildlife management in our state is a bipartisan issue, one that involves all of us. But the inaction of the complete DFL trifecta in Minnesota is failing Minnesotans. And it's hard to stand here today realizing that no debate and no conversation was held over proper wildlife management in Minnesota. Currently in state law, the DNR is only directed to survey northeastern Minnesota as it relates to the wolf population. The vast majority of my district and Representative Murphy's district and countless others aren't even surveyed for the number of wolves that they have. And if we are saying today, if the DNR is saying today that the wolf population is between 2,900 and 3,000 wolves in only the northeastern part of the state, how many more wolves, how many more wolves are impacting our wildlife populations throughout the entirety of the state? whether in southeastern Minnesota, the far western part of Minnesota, or any other corner, including communities near the metro. The result of inaction is devastation for the future of our hunting and outdoor heritage. And we could have taken up conversations this, this session and during this legislature to prioritize this. And Republicans are committed to having these conversations and advancing bills and legislative priorities that get Minnesota back to responsible wildlife management. Because inaction is failure. We must restore responsible wildlife management to this state and get our state back on track. Further discussion to the bill. The member from Travers, Representative Backer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There's two points I would like to point out. You know, in, in my neck of the woods on the western part of Minnesota, um, we're, we're pretty flat. You can actually see um, a deer um, three, four miles away. Uh, if we go a foot elevation in one mile, um, that's about it. And it's, it's one of the richest soils out here. And because of the Red River Valley, which I represent, we help to feed the world. I mean, think about that. West Central Minnesota, we help feed the world with so soybeans, corn, and wheat being the top three products, agriculture products made here in, um, growing here, excuse me, in Minnesota. Unfortunately, this bill feels like, and I hate to use these words because they're strong words, another war on agriculture. Um, there was a lot of things shared here today. Two things that I like to point out that um, 
my constituents would say would be quite odd, I'll just use that word, they use other words than that, is that drain tile, tile disclosure. Folks in my area, here's how you have to relate to it. If you bought an old home, took down all the sheet rocks, put in all new piping, all new plumbing, all new wiring, you would get a better value for that home. So if you went to sell that home, you would say, hey, potential buyers, I put in new plumbing, new piping, new electrical wires. That's exactly the same thing with drain tile. It raises the value. It actually creates clean water, which we want a better clean water because it runs down to Lake Travers, into the Red River Valley, or the southern part of my district, into Big Stone, down to Ortonville, Madam Speaker, um, and so forth. So um, that's why it's so odd, because you're going to want to disclose that, because um, you're going to get more per acre, you're going to get better production, better yields, which what happens? We're feeding Minnesota better. So that is just one of the odd things in this bill. Second thing is um, even more bizarre, in my opinion. Uh, Ten years ago, we had this conversation about buffers. And one of the things individuals continue to forget is that's taking of land in the metro area, if we're building for a train, like the Southwest um, Rail or doing a highway, we have to acquire the land. The state has to acquire that land. That never happened with buffers. Mm -mm. Nope. Um, the state of Minnesota said, through Bowser, you have to do it a certain way. Um, and then there was some flexibility because of that wisdom and some flexibility and time, landowners being Minnesota nice decided, you know, yep, we got to work with it. And we have right now 98% compliance. And generally forcing people to do something is not the best way. That's why over these last 10 years, we have reached 98% um, compliance with the buffer. But in this bill, this goes from 500 bucks violation to $10,000. I'll say it again, for $500 to $10,000, that's just, that's like a 4,000% increase. That is just absurd. And what it's doing is saying government knows best. Let's continue to work. And government doesn't know best, by the way. Um, we have a tendency government to screw things up. Um, and that's why that slow approach, working with the landowners through the soil water conservation district's work. Some of Traverse County was probably one of the areas that uh, the landowners fought um, the hardest against it. And over time, worked with them and they fell into compliance. So those are just two of the reasons that we need to vote no on this. And um, thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to address one issue. Members received at their desk a letter from Medical Alley um, talking about just a very small provision in the bill, but it has big implications in my district. So um, as many members may know, or I honestly didn't know until a while ago, um, there are two types of PFAS. Some is water soluble, some is non-soluble. And so as the bill makes progress um, through the Senate and the conference committee, I would just like to ask that um, Chair Hansen and members of the conference committee take this into account when they look at those reporting requirements. Because the non-soluble, um, water-soluble PFAS is very different from the water-soluble and it has, it won't be caught up in all of the um, water contamination issues that are generally associated publicly with PFAS, but it has nothing to do with these devices that are critical to the health of our citizens and um, to a lot of the businesses in my district who, who make these devices, these life-saving devices. So Chair Hansen, I'm just bringing that to your attention and I ask for you to uh, keep that in mind as the bill moves forward. Thank you. Oh, the member from Hennepin, Representative Nadal.
the member from Hennepin, Representative Jordan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and members, thank you for the discussion today. Uh, my uh, remarks are going to be focused on Article 5 of the bill um, because members, Minnesota has a waste problem and 40% of that waste comes from packaging. We could fill 10 target fields with the packaging waste that we put in landfills and incinerators in Minnesota. That's not all waste, that's just the waste from packaging. And this is going to grow as we shift to more and more of an e-commerce economy. In the metro alone, the amount of waste generated is projected to grow by 19% over the next two decades. And currently we and our constituents, people, are responsible for the cost of our products and life because we pay taxes to our local governments and fees to deal with our waste. Much of what we could recycle or compost is put in a landfill or burned in incinerators. Creating new plastics and products and then transporting that waste to end markets exacerbates climate change and puts emissions into our environment. And Minnesota does have a strong foundation of recycling, but a 2024 report found that more than 65% of our cardboard, paper, bottles, cans, and other recyclables still end up in Minnesota landfills and incinerators or as plastic pollution in our environment. Our system is overwhelmed, underperforming, outdated, and unjust. And Article 5, um, which started out as the bill called the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act, is the solution. We need to both generate less waste and deal with the waste that we produce more effectively. And Article 5 does both. And the conceit behind this is that the producers of waste pay. Not your voters, Madam Speaker, and members who have no choice in the packaging the products they use come in. A lot of you have heard this bill um, and heard this story probably as it's been through committees, but I would encourage you to imagine your local grocery store, which for me is located in the quarry in northeast Minneapolis, um, and you, you need laundry detergent. And you have a lot of choice in the kind of laundry detergent you buy. You could get flakes, you could get liquid, you could get pods, you could get the fresh scent, you could get hypoallergenic. Um, but you don't have a choice in what that laundry detergent comes in. It all comes in a plastic package. Um, and so this bill so importantly ensures that all packaging, Madam Speaker, in Minnesota will be reusable, recyclable, and compostable by 2032. Um, there was one misconception said about this bill that I feel I need to um, clean up. Representative Scraba, e-waste is not in this bill. That's a different bill that's not part of this. So Article 5 only refers to waste associated with packaging. Um, but members, you should be really excited to vote for this bill, not because it does reduce costs and increases recycling, but it's a good consumer bill. There are huge cost savers to your taxpayers and your local governments. Counties were a driving force behind this bill in addition to our um, zero waste advocates, and they're begging for this. It's not just my county in Hennepin County or Ramsey County, but recently even um, the Hubbard County Solid Waste Administrator wrote an article to, um, wrote a letter to the editor begging for this act. We've worked with county waste administrators from across the state on this. Um, there are investments in Minnesota manufacturing. Many of our local manufacturers are asking for uh, these materials that start out as packaging waste to be generated and turned into materials in manufacturing. And furthermore, small businesses are actually investing in reuse. Um, in, in Minneapolis, I was excited this past winter on one of our only snowy uh, weekends to go to the Lopit, the World Cup. Um, and all of the, and I'm not much of a skier, although it was exciting to cheer on Jesse Diggins, but, um, I do enjoy our local beer scene here in Minnesota. And I was really excited that every cup at the World Cup that you could get beer in or something else if you so chose was in a reusable cup. Not just a recyclable cup, but there is a local business in Minnesota called Our World, which supplied all of the cups for the World Cup. And so you could get your beer and you could return it and they would reuse that, which is a higher use than even recycling. So this bill incentivizes our small businesses in Minnesota who are asking for both the materials and the ability to reuse these products. This is a good bill for public health. Toxics and microplastics are accumulating in our bodies. Um, the average American consumes a credit card worth of plastic every week. So a credit card, think about your credit card and your plastic, you are taking that into your body, in the food that you eat, in the air that you breathe, and the things you come into contact with. You are consuming that much plastic, and so are your family members. So are your loved ones, so are your children, your grandchildren, your parents. That's not right. Microplastics have been found in breast milk, blood, placenta, and other bodily fluids. Basically everywhere they look in your body, they're finding microplastics. 
And the National Institute of Health found links between microplastic in human bodies and liver damage, damage to human reproductive systems, and our immune responses. This legislature last year took action to define the problem of microplastics, and now we can define the solution. There are important uh, public health benefits to our environmental justice concerns. So right now, many of these plastics are ending up in our landfills and in our trash incinerators. When they end up in our landfills, that ends up in our soil where our food is grown, and it ends up in our water that we drink. When it's burned in incinerators, like the one that I live downwind from, I take that in and breathe that every day. So do my constituents, and so do uh, Chair Lee's constituents, and so do many of your constituents who are breathing in that air. That's getting into our lungs and into our bodies. Not only is it producing microplastics in our bodies, it's also correlating with higher upper respiratory disease. We know that there is a correlation between asthma and our performance in schools. So you need to like, worry about this when we're thinking about what is causing kids to miss school. And often it is public health concerns such as asthma. Um, this is also just a really good bill for the environment. One of the number one questions I heard when this bill was in committee was around littering. Uh, you know, we're, we see litter everywhere we go and, making, and a lot of it comes from plastics. I live on a busy street and much of it is coming from all of the packaging and much of it is plastics. It ends up in my yard, but it also ends up in the, um, the drain next to my yard. In fact, it's even clogged my drain where the city of Minneapolis had to come out and remove plastic bags from the drain that was outside my yard after it uh, flooded the streets. Um, there's also an investment in recycling and in the facilities that are actually doing the recycling. Not in landfills, which are reaching the sky, like Representative Hansen said, where we have landfills that are now bigger than our ski jumps, um, or in incinerators that spew smoke into the air by baseball fields. And it also stops the shedding of microplastics, like I said, into our, wa into our water and soil. This protects water, um, wildlife, and plant life. Microplastics have been found in the bodies of earthworms in the Boundary Waters Wilderness. And not in some of those lakes on the edge. This has been found in some of those lakes several portages deep. Uh, lakes that it would take you days to be able to canoe to. But researchers from the University of Wisconsin dissected earthworms and found microplastics in them. That is how deep this problem goes, is not only is it in our bodies in northeast Minneapolis, but it's in our earthworms in northeastern Minnesota. So for many years, Minnesota was considered a leader in recycling, and we no longer are. So by passing this bill, we can be that leader again. So I urge you to vote yes. The member from Crow Wing, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, thank you to all of you that have weighed in on this bill today. I think that we've had a good debate, good discussion of our, uh, quite honestly, in most cases, shared values of clean air, clean water, a uh, improved regulatory system to make sure that we have the processes in place at MPCA and DNR to address the needs of both uh, the people of Minnesota and that balance with nature. Uh, there's certainly uh, a lot that has been covered uh, by members on both sides of the aisle today. I think where we quite often have disagreements is how do we get from point A to completion? And yes, I favor a more, uh, 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 a more uh, maybe friendly approach, uh, a little more carrot, a little less stick. And I, I do think that those shared values can be accomplished when we work together. And I hope that going forward in conference committee, we have that opportunity to iron out some of those details that, where, that we might not have agreement. We've covered a, a number of, of concerning subject areas in the bill, whether it was the new rules for boat wrap and, and how do we get those materials to a single facility. Maybe a test product or a test project would have been a better approach as opposed to a statewide rollout that we really don't know how that's going to work or not work. Some of the ag language that's in this bill, it sounds like it really didn't have the opportunity that we would have liked to see it come through the ag committee and have a more robust discussion there. Some of the language as it relates to trees, again, shared values. We want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to capture carbon and to clean the air and 
Trees are a critical part of not only Minnesota's economy, but also uh, it's very important uh, in that process of capturing carbon and clean air. The more trees we can put on the landscape, the better, and it's a uh, renewable resource. We all agree on that. There's no disagreement there. So I'm not going to go on. A lot of this has already been covered, so I'm going to cut it short. But uh, Representative Hansen, I want to thank you for running, I think, a very good committee. And uh, all the staff that have been involved in uh, getting to where we are today, Peter and Amy primarily are kind of our go-to, but there's so many others, and I'm going to miss one. That's usually how it goes. So um, thank you to all those that work to make sure our bills got drafted and all of the amendments and whatever it is that we needed, materials and so on. Um, we, we th I think we got through some uh, challenging conversations without too much, too much uh, disagreement. We obviously have, like I said, a different approach, but for the most part, I, I feel like we, uh, we had an opportunity to be heard, those of us on the minority. Sometimes it might have been a little short here and there, but we usually had an opportunity to address that later, and I appreciate that, Representative Hansen. So members, I'm, I'm going to be a no on this bill today, not, probably not surprisingly, but I do think it's important that the work continues, and I'm glad that I uh, have an opportunity to do that going forward. So uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, we'll move on. Thank you. Again. To the author of the bill, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, thank you for the uh, discussion. Uh, you know, it is, a, it is a bright day out there. Again, a good day to plant trees. Uh, we do have differences of opinion. And part of those differences of opinion are measured by experience. And I've been in this chair, literally this chair, for 20 years. I've been in the minority. I've been in the majority. I've given very similar speeches about things I didn't like. Uh, Representative Anderson, I see you're nodding your head. You may remember those. Uh, but it, I think as Minnesotans, we're trying to do better. And what I'm trying to say here is that it's not just about providing the investments. We provided significant investments last year, and we're provide, trying to provide additional investments this year. But we do need to change policies. We need to adapt to the changing information we receive. Why do we put definitions in there? 20 years ago, we weren't talking about neonicotinoids and treated seed. Now we're talking about them being in us, about neonicotinoids being in us. So you can't manage what you can't measure. And by putting these definitions in, that does, yes, I'll admit it, we're building a framework for the future for future people, future members, so they can look back and say, are we putting things in? What is the definition of this? What is the framework? And that's what we're trying to do with helium. We're saying this is a huge issue. I think we had testimony that it could generate a million dollars a day for someone. That's a pretty big incentive to do something, a million dollars a day. So we better get it right for Minnesotans. We better get it right in terms of the resource, but we better get it right in terms of environmental protection. And so we put in a moratorium, and we're putting in that time for the agencies, and we demanded a public process. That public process, we now have the technology to zoom in and get more people involved in the decision making. And the more people that are involved in those decisions, I'll go Representative Burkle, the, the feral hog issue. We had really good engagement with virtual meetings. And more people, once we asked them for their opinion, we got it. And that helped build a better product. So I know it's, it's easy sometimes to vote no, because you can always find something in a bill that you don't like. I'm asking you to take the risk to vote yes. A vote yes that we can do better. A vote yes that this is a comprehensive yet supplemental bill, a bill that can lay the foundation, rebalance some of the investments we made last year, and have a better outcome for Minnesotans. 
because that's why we're all here. Vote yes. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The chief clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Here you go. Carol I. Carol I. Howard. Howard votes aye. Howard I. Cagle. Cagle I. Cagle I. Tabkey. Tabkey I. Tabkey I. The clerk will close the roll. There being 68 ayes and 63 noes, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar is House File 5040. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> House File number 5040, number two on the calendar for today, an act relating to retirement, the second engrossment. There are amendments at the desk. If there are no objections, we will let the author explain the bill before we act on amendments. To the author of the bill, Representative Herr. Thank you, Madam Speaker. House File 5040 is the 2024 Pension and Retirement Supplemental Budget and Policy Bill. This bill contains the entire work of the bipartisan, bicameral Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement. It is great to consider this bill, which significantly supports Minnesota's public workers on May Day, an internationally recognized holiday for workers. This is the third consecutive year that this legislature has fought for and received a separate budget target for pensions. This funding, which was fought for by our state workers, commission members, and leadership of both parties and both chambers, demonstrates that every one of us understands the importance of a secure retirement. Our bill spends the educator pension line of the budget agreement that totals $31.458 million. We spend it in three appropriations. $28.4 million will be appropriate to the Teachers Retirement Association in order to move the effective date for the change to teachers of normal retirement age from 65 to 66 from July 1st of 2025 to July 1st of 2024. $1.5 million will be appropriated to the St. Paul Teachers Retirement Fund Association to provide an employee contribution decrease for the next two years. And $1.4 million will be appropriated to the Minnesota Individual Retirement Plan, or IRAP, to TRA transfer accounts to ensure Minnesota state employees who were incorrectly not given the option to elect into a TRA pension the ability to do so and support the transfer of their retirement account. This solution comes from the IRAP to TRA work group we passed last year that diligently worked in the interim. This bill also makes a number of important policy changes that will strengthen and further solidify Minnesotans' retirement uh, prospects, including integrate the important changes made by the State Auditor's 2024 Volunteer Firefighter Work Group to support our Volunteer Firefighters Retirement Associations, ensuring TRA and St. Paul Teachers Plan members can continue working to aid our state's workforce shortage codify a program that Minnesota State Patrol members can use to continue working for their unit until age 60 without being penalized by earning caps, permitting home and community-based service employees to participate in the Secure Choice Retirement Program, allowing all workers to count student loan payments as the employee's contribution to retirement savings to receive the employer match for their retirement benefit protecting state appropriations for our public pension plans by changing the look back for full funding of the plan from one year to three years for the direct state aids are not turned off for plans if there is a short-term investment return bump, and matching the Employee Retirement Association Correctional Plan benefit multiplier to the statewide correctional plan at 2.2% in order to keep our local correctional employees benefit package competitive with the statewide plan. 
This bill also contains a number of technical changes that the LCPR and pension staff have spent significant time reworking this year. We conform our state retirement statutes to federal requirements under Secure 2.0 Act of 2022, provide for a cleanup of workers' compensation offset language in PARA, and bring the PARA defined contribution plan into federal compliance. This bill contains provisions from nearly every member of the LCPR and others from outside of the commission, including Representatives Nadeau, Chab, Berg, O'Driscoll, Nelson, Stevenson, Frederick Moeller, Beckerfin, Tabke, Feist, and Purcell, and Senators Pappas, Frentz, Rasmussen, Nelson, Westland, Sieber Sieberger, Gustafson, and House Child. And so um, I know that there are some amendments here today, and I will save my thank yous for um, the, the third reading. So, Madam uh, Speaker, um, I will, that's the summary of the bill. Members, I want to remind members to take your conversations to the ALCO. It can get quite noisy up here. Uh, there is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Mm. Her moves to amend House Law number 5040, the second engrossment. The amendment is coded A1. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Her. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This amendment does two things. The first part of the amendment, um, state aid for local firefighters, this is calculated. Uh, and what we do with this is the change helps the Revenue Department not have to recalculate 2024 direct state aid. The second part of this is uh, concurring with the Senate. It is a technical fix that the, uh, the at the suggestion of Senate fiscal analysts and revisers, um, they made this recommendation um, as that uh, dollars need to be rounded off to the nearest thousands of dollars. And so this is just a technical change to bring all of this in line. And I ask for a green vote on this, Madam Speaker. Discussion to the amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor of the A1 amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's a, another amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Schultz moves to amend House Law number 5040, the second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded uh, dash 8A. To the author of the amendment, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The 8A amendment adds a little bit more clarifying language, uh, just a few more um, essentially restrictions around uh, the benefits that would be applied to the Minnesota state retirement systems. And those specific restrictions are to ensure that nobody who is here in our state, in our country illegally would be considered uh, as an employee. And so that is my, uh, that is my uh, motion, Madam Speaker. Discussion. Representative Herr. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Schultz, so I know um, you're, you're newer to this body, and I'm sorry, did you ask me to yield or are you done with your, oh, okay, so I'm just talking to the bill. Uh, to the, okay, <laughs> got it. Sorry, somebody was talking to me while I was trying to listen to this. Um, I know that you're newer here, so I, and maybe there's, um, I just want to share with the body that the Pension Commission actually point is. Point of order. A, Say your point in order. Madam Speaker, all members are, have an election certificate and shall be treated equal regardless of the seniority here. I would like to, we should, well, except for one member. <laughs> and uh, I, it would be good for the speaker to remind the members that. Just go back to Representative Kosnick, I didn't hear a rule, but that is duly noted. Representative Herr. Uh, and my apologies, Madam Speaker, because this is not to talk about seniors, it's to give Representative Schultz some backgrounds that pensions is actually a bipartisan, bicameral um, bill, a commission, and so when it comes out of the commission, it's usually already agreed upon, and so we don't generally amend it, but I will explain why this amendment is actually not good for the bill as well. So this is just so the rest of the body understands that, that we don't usually ever put amendments onto it unless it's technical fixes, because there is already agreement upon both bodies and both parties. Um, so what I'm going to say first is that Representative Schultz's amendment does two things. The first part is it prohibits undocumented workers from enrolling in the MSRA plan, which is unnecessary. Only state employees can enroll in the MSRS plan and all state employees are required to complete an I-9 employment from, uh, form verifying that they are citizens or authorized to work in the state. So uh, his uh, amendment is actually unnecessary. The second part of this is that it deletes a provision in the bill allowing visa holders to enroll in the state plan and to purchase service credits for previous years when they were prohibited from participating in the plan. The provision is required so the MSRS plan is compliant with federal law. This is not a state law. This is to comply with federal law. State pension plans cannot discriminate against visa holders in retirement plan participation. So I recommend a no vote on this amendment. Further discussion? Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd request a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be roll call. 
Further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. <clears throat> Carol. Here you go. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Kegel. Kegel, no. Kegel, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 58 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House Hall number 5040, as amended. Third reading. Discussion. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, members. Um, you know, I'm only going to point out, uh, you know, one or two things about this bill, and I, I, I thank Representative Hansen for what he said at his third reading when he closed the last bill. Y you know, there, one thing I really appreciate about pensions, I really appreciate the approach that the chair takes in letting me kind of go down paths and I think that that's I think that that's an important I think that that's an important thing especially for people who are new and uh, you know she gave me a lot of leash to work on an issue that I that I found important um, and and I really appreciated that and there's things in this bill that I don't love um, but there's a lot of really good things in this bill and this bill really is a is a technical bill and I'm happy to support it um, and I think, uh, and I recommend everybody vote green on this bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Further discussion? The member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, I want to, again, underscore some important provisions that are in this bill. Um, we have had our Minnesota law enforcement officials and, and public safety officials under a lot of public pressure these days for performing the job that they do. And I want to thank the State Patrol's, uh, uh, State Patrol's uh, Trooper Association for working with the Pension Commission to come up with a way to help with people who are retiring from the State Patrol but still have so much more to give and are willing to give back to the people in the state of Minnesota. Um, just a quick little history lesson. In the state of Minnesota, troopers are mandated by state law to retire no later than reaching age 60. And many of the troopers from our study show that they leave the, um, the profession at age 55. Many of them would like to stay around and mentor other, other um, troopers as they're coming in and working to continue to make Minnesota a safe place. We have found a way to be able to do that to preserve their benefit and to also allow them to be a part of the active force of in law enforcement here in the state of Minnesota. Another thing that I think is rather important in here is that we've heard from um, teacher groups and associations about wanting to um, vi revisit the retirement age for teachers and we were able to accomplish bringing that down by one year. 
I know that that doesn't seem like a lot if you're a younger teacher, but it is showing that the legislature does recognize and does support um, readdressing some of those those issues for teachers. Um, can't do it this year, um, time, money, but we certainly have our eye on that. And as is always the case, we get a chance to review different statutes and update and clarify items and the classification of employees as their job description changes. Um, members, you should feel very comfortable and the Minnesota public should feel very comfortable as well that we have a strong bipartisan and bicameral group of people who are working on the Pension Commission. We meet at 8.30 every Monday morning. And we have members who are on the commission from all parts of the state. And I mean, some of those members have to give up the time with their families, risk weather coming down to be able to make sure that they are here at an 8.30 a.m. meeting. And they do it because of the commitment that the public officials, like the police officers, the teachers, and others that I've mentioned. For the, because we made promises to these folks, we want to be able to continue to stay engaged and to keep those promises to those individuals. And so members, I strongly encourage a yes vote on the 2024 pension bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Dakota, Representative Berg. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Just um, a really heartfelt thank you to our chair. Uh, my first um, term here, uh, I was also on the Pension Commission. We met on a Tuesday night um, by Zoom because it was COVID, so I get that. But um, it was almost like the commission was a little bit of an afterthought. And I know how hard our chair fought to get it to be a regular committee. I don't love 8.30 a.m. on Monday, but it's an honor to be in the work to make sure that our workers uh, get to build the legacy they deserve after public service. Um, I know she fought very hard to get an unheard of target um, this year for our workers, so I'm deeply grateful to her. She ran her committee with grace. She met with everyone, um, all the stakeholders, took into account all the frustrations and emotions from the different groups that we are responsible for, and her leadership is an example. I look forward to a fully green board. To the author of the bill, Representative Her. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, members. Um, I'm just going to take this time to say a couple of thank yous because this is a really good bill and it is a bipartisan bill. I want to first say thank you to uh, Lee O'Driscoll, who has, at any time that I needed to have a conversation, needed to bounce off ideas, needed to figure out how to navigate something, he was always there to do that. And I really appreciate his leadership and his partnership in this work. Representative Nadeau, who uh, I always appreciate your rabbit holes because I don't know where it's gonna go, and, but it does sometimes lead us to some really great things. And truthfully, I think that sometimes when we look at when something isn't successful or that we don't fund something, we think of that as a failure, but Representative Nadeau's work was such a success because it showed people that we were really to invest and explore every option and turn over every rock. And it takes a great deal of courage and a great deal of uh, persistence in order to do that kind of work. And so I really appreciate you for uh, your commitment to all of our members Members on our side here, uh, Representative Chubb, Representative Berg, Representative um, Wolgamont, who sometimes I forget he's on the commission and then I tell him he's not a member and I have to move his bill, but that's not true. So um, you know that your commitment, it was because you were willing to show up and to fight uh, for workers that we were able to do the work that we did. And and I, I don't think that any of our members actually missed one commission hearing. Um, and I left Representative Nelson off of this because I, I wanted to just say a special thank you to Representative of Nelson because this is his last year with us and he is the um really the glue that uh, that holds us, well, uh, with Representative O'Driscoll, I don't want to just say there's one glue, there's a lot of glue, but he's the one who I relied on for historical data and information, and we all know that pensions, it's not something you make a decision at one point in time, there's ripple effects forever, and that the fact that Representative Nelson was there to actually provide um, that leadership and that guidance and that support, that I so greatly appreciate you, and we will miss you in the commission when you are no longer here with us, and so we are a better state because you served it, you served on this commission with us. Um, I also just want to say thank you to our Senate members. Um, I do know that some of our Republican members traveled a great deal, and Representative uh, Senator Nelson said to me, 
I dreaded doing this in the beginning, but I'm so glad I'm a part of this. And I come every week ready to work at 8.30 in the morning. And that was the biggest compliment I think I could have ever received from somebody who has to travel away a long ways, who has to give up time with their family, but really did this hard work with us. And so I wanted to just thank our, our Senate um, uh, counterparts, Senator Pappas, Seberger, Westland, Nelson, Howe, and Rasmussen. I want to thank our uh, staff, uh, nonpartisan staff, Director, Executive Director Susan Lincheski, Deputy Director Sean Kelly, Commissioner uh, Commission Assistant Lisa Deslin, partisan staff, uh, Nick Stumalanger, who literally is like my right arm. I just, I don't know what I would do without him. He helps me remember the million things that uh, was coming into this work. Um, John uh, Baylor, who, uh, I don't think I say John's name right, but John, who is our uh, DFL researcher, um, and uh, Ryan Majeris, who is the Senate DFL researcher, to our plan directors, who I make them meet with me frequently. They come in whenever we need to speak. I meet weekly with some of them, um, you know, to Executive Director Doug Anderson uh, from PARA, um, PARA Legislative Liaison Amy Strangey, MSRS Executive Director Aaron Leonard, MSRS Legislative Liaison Jenkins um, um, Vaughn, at, at TRA Executive Director Jay Stoffel, TRA Deputy Director Tim Maurer, Legislative, uh, TRA Legislative Liaison Holly Dayton, T, uh, TRA a legal and legislative director, Rachel Barth, St. Paul Teacher Retirement Fund Association Executive Director, Phil Tensick, and also just the last two, our policy advisor, Simone uh, Ferson, and MMB Executive Director, Tom Carr. It is because of this ginormous team that we were able to run such a great commission, and like Representative Berg said, we fought really hard to make this really meaningful work in three years in a row, we received targets. I cannot be more proud of a product when we had such little money, we did some uh, really fantastic work and the policy changes that we made will have great impact on our workers and our pension members here in the state of Minnesota. Members, I ask for your green vote to support this uh, fantastic bipartisan bicameral bill. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The clerk, the chief clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, aye. Carol, aye. Howard. Howard votes aye. Howard, aye. Cagle. Cagle, aye. Cagle, aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 130 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. Motions and resolutions. Representative Long. Uh, Madam Speaker, I move that House File 2476 as amended be taken from the table. Representative Long moves that House File 70... 2476 24, be taken from the table. All those, this is a non-debatable motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. no. The motion prevails. Representative, report, report the, the clerk will report the bill. <coughs> House file number 2476, an act relating to children. Members, we are on the Schultz motion to reconsider the vote whereby uh, Representative Hicks' amendment to House File 2476. There is a roll call. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll.
The chief clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. There you go. Carol, no. Carol, no. Howard. Howard, no. Howard, no. Cagle. Cagle, no. Cagle, no. <clears throat> the clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House Law number 2476, as amended. Third reading, discussion. The member from Fillmore, Representative Davis. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and yes, I am from Fillmore. Representative Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I know we look a lot alike. <laughs> so. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, House File uh, 2476, it has a lot of wasteful spending in it. Um, it does nothing to adequately address the child care crisis. You know, we've lost around a thousand family child care centers, child care facilities in the la just in the last few years. That's unprecedented. And it's not right. Uh, I'm not a big fan, uh, those who serve on, in committees with me, I've, I've spoken about this a lot. I'm not a big fan of spending other people's money. Uh, and that's what we do here. We, we spend a lot of other people's money. I remember I'm a freshman, so I've only been here last year, last year and now here this year. And we've spent a lot of other people's money, the people's money. And, uh, and just to clarify, I don't have a problem with spending the people's money on roads, bridges, wa uh, clean water, law enforcement, obviously, from earlier, law enforcement, critical needs. I'm all on board with that. We should all be on board with that. Educating our children for their needs, you know, like reading, writing, arithmetic, reading, writing, arithmetic, reading. And I, I hope you all work with me and this side of the aisle to get the governor's attention on this one. Reading scores down 16% since he came into office. Please help us convince him that he needs to spend more time being concerned about the well-being of our children, because he spends a lot of time letting us know that he's a teacher or was a teacher. He spends a lot of time letting Minnesota know that we're trying to ban books, which is absolutely false. We're just trying to keep inappropriate material out of the hands of fifth graders. Please help us with that message. Uh, another thing I, I don't have a uh, problem spending money on, critical infrastructure. Uh, we need a new digital superhighway in SSIS. Thank you, Representative Nelson, for the effort and the attention that you've brought to the fact that we need a critical infrastructure upgrade when it comes to SSIS. But you didn't seem too interested in helping us with that problem either. Instead, in my first two years here, my first term, we blew through an $18 billion surplus. It would have been the perfect time 
to rebuild that critical infrastructure right there, Representative Nelson. And I don't think it would have taken 10 years. It probably would have taken more like two, maybe three years to rebuild that. And so we could have been potentially looking at a new system next year. We blew through an $18 billion surplus. We raised taxes by nearly $10 billion. We grew government by almost 40 percent. All at a time when Minnesotans are really struggling. And Minnesota is well on its way to becoming the number one employer in the state. Folks, that should not be. The state of Minnesota should not be the number one employer in the state. We have a bloated bureaucracy, folks. I've spent time in committee talking about the two philosophies I think I'll spare us tonight, but socialism versus free market capitalism, socialism versus Reaganomics, a great president from our past, President Reagan, he had this awesome idea, okay, maybe I will go into it just briefly, awesome idea that when you lower taxes, and let the people actually keep their hard-earned money, guess what they do? They spend it into the economy. They sow it into our economy. That then, in turn, builds our economy. People spend more money. Businesses are thriving. People can get paid more when businesses are thriving. And guess what that does for the government? It brings in more tax money. <laughs> when you actually let people keep more of their money, Reagan proved that it worked. He said this, he said, uh, I'll give you a couple Reagan quotes. He said, death and taxes may be inevitable, but unjust taxes are not. And I believe that that's what this bill is going to help with. Unjust taxes on Minnesotans. He also said this, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Are we destroying the lives of Minnesotans and their income by taxing the hell out of them? Because a lot of Minnesotans, they're paying 30 to 40 percent in taxes between the federal and state government, 30 to 40 percent of the money that they work very hard for is going to pay income taxes. 30 to 40 percent, and in some situations more than that. Think about that. That's money that they need to provide for their families. And we're robbing them of it. Taking money from hardworking people and giving it to people who don't work so hard for it, that's immoral. It's wrong. You want to know what else is immoral? Fraud. I've heard a lot of that in the first two years of being here, too. I've seen a lot of bills come through committee that have the potential for fraud. Feeding our future is in the news again, folks. Massive fraud uh, scheme involving more than $250 million stolen right from under Governor Walz's nose. It's a scheme that involved a web of shady nonprofits with the aim of stealing money from hungry kids and vulnerable adults. It's a scheme that involved imaginary kids, fake receipts, made up invoices, kickbacks, and bribes galore. You know, let me just say, I'm real happy that none of us are involved in that. Or are we? So 
So far, this federal investigation has resulted in more than 70 defendants, nearly 20 guilty pleas, and this week marks the opening of the first trial of several Feeding Our Future defendants. In their opening statements, prosecutors revealed messages point between order, conspiracy conspirators where one of the defendants State, wrote, Mason's 101. The food stuff. Your, Representative I have Davis, floor. Representative Long has oh, the floor. I'm sorry. Mason's 101. Uh, debate must be confined to the question before the body. Talking about a trial is not the question before the body, which is a bill that we are discussing. Members, please keep your remarks to the discussion of the bill. Representative Davis. Will do, Madam Speaker, and thank you. And if Representative Long could have just waited like five more seconds, I was getting to my point which I will continue. One of the defendants wrote, this food stuff is kind of a golden ticket, and that's what I want to focus on. This food stuff is kind of a golden ticket, they wrote. Another one bragged, in seven months, if things stay the same, you are, multi, you are a multi-millionaire with zero debt. Almost sounds like a magic money tree of fraud. Yeah, we'll keep shaking that tree. You provided a golden ticket for fraud and burglarizing the Minnesota taxpayer. We should all be against burglary. The reason I bring this up is we know that fraud is not limited to nutritional programs. We've seen fraud in the CCAP program, the adult care program, the PCA program, and we find many connections between these schemes. Democrats haven't changed their way. The Democrat Party has not changed their way. I'm sitting this year in committee listening to a bill on universal basic income. And I'm, I'm sitting in committee and, you know, my mind was blown away last year quite often with what I heard and, and this year was no different. We're going to give folks $500 a month for 18 months. Hey, let me repeat that. $500 a month for 18 months, and all they have to do is meet 300% over the poverty level or under. Now, I don't like to give away my income, but I went home so shocked, I said, honey, you got to punch in the numbers. Do we qualify? And sure enough, we qualified. I couldn't believe it. No, I would not sign up for such a ridiculous program. And I even asked a question in the committee. Um, so let's say someone gets signed up for this, and the next day they go out and they get a job that's a very good paying job. Will they then get taken off the program? And I was told, no, they'll continue to stay on that program for 18 months. And you don't even need to prove that you're a resident of Minnesota and you don't have to prove that you're a United States citizen. And you want to know the ones that would be in charge of overseeing the money? You know where the, mon the state would give the money to? Point of order, Madam Speaker. Nonprofits. Stay your point of which order. Which is going right Mason's into my next point that has Davids. to do with this bill. Representative Davids. Representative Mason's Long. 101 must confine remarks to the subject of the debate. The provision that the representative is speaking to is not in the bill, so it is not the subject of our debate. Members, please keep your remarks to the discussion of the bill. Back to you, Representative Thank Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will just say I will not be bullied into shutting out the voice of my district because this is important to my district and their voice will be heard on this House floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Clay, Representative. Oh. 
Representative Davis. My mic is still working, right? Okay. You still have the floor. Thank you. So I will continue. That bill had feeding our future, that was like feeding our future on steroids. Now we look no further than across the street for misplaced priorities. Excuse me. There. A three quarter of a billion dollar palace for us politicians. $730 million. This project is being point funded order, Madam Speaker. through a standing and open State your appropriation. Point of order. I wish I didn't have to keep rising, but the member is not speaking to the bill. He is speaking to, it sounds like anything but the bill. We have other bills that we can debate in the future, but right now we are debating the Children and Families Bill. If he'd like, I can provide him a copy of the bill so he can take a look at what's in it and can focus his remarks to it. Members, please keep your remarks to the discussion of the bill. Representative Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Don't worry, Representative Long, I'm almost done. And what I've noticed, and I, I, I now have to take the time to explain why this is relevant to the bill, why I cannot support fraud and wasteful spending. Do I really need to explain that? I guess so. And that's what it has to do with the bill before us, Representative Long. Folks on this floor are constantly explaining their heart, their story, and reasons why they can't support a bill. Please do not shut down the voice of my district in doing so. This project is being funded, the three-quarter of a billion dollar palace for politicians being funded through a standing and open appropriation. That means even if we adjourned right now, sine die, which what a blessing that would be, the hedge fund managers financing that palace with extravagant balconies, they'll still get paid. They'll still get paid. While parents with children continue to wait for affordable child care. Is that reason enough to talk about this regarding this bill? I think so. While parents and children continue to wait for affordable child care. Yeah, you already blew through an $18 billion surplus, raised taxes by nearly $10 billion, and grew government by nearly 40%, all the while that Minnesotans are hurting. Democrats are making life harder and more expensive for Minnesotans. Also, politicians can have an extravagant office and a monument to big government. Not only this bill, but the bill in taxes has come in Minnesota, and the price is going to have to be paid. Buckle up. It's time to hold this majority accountable. I cannot support this bill. Please vote no on this bill. The member from right, Representative Hudson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So this year in Children and Families started out with a fair amount of pageantry. Uh, I believe we had our first committee hearing before the session even started. Um, and it was for the purpose of showcasing the idea of what is called the Great Start Affordability Scholarships. And this is the premise that we're going to provide state funding to pay for families' child care above 7% of household income. Like just no cap, nothing, we're just gonna pay for all of it. And we've spent so much time, like a real lion's share of our time in children and families, hearing the sales pitch for this idea. And it's a great sales pitch. 
It's absolutely fantastic. It actually has a lot of merit, as any good sales pitch would. Talking about the value of early childhood education, talking about the economic utility of spending money on childcare, talking about all the features and benefits, and, and really hooking in there with the emotional hook of caring about our kids, appealing to the fact that we all do care about our kids and we want to get them off to a good start. We want them to be able to read. We want them to be able to have that executive function. We want them to be able to succeed in life. Absolutely fantastic sales pitch on the features and benefits of paying for everybody's childcare. But there's been a critical piece missing from the sales pitch that has prevented it from ever being closed and is, I suspect, the reason why it's not included in this bill that has come before us today. And that's the price tag. Really a big deal. Really the crucial component of any given sales pitch because it's not until you hear the price, it's not until you hear what's it gonna cost me that you're able to actually engage in the value calculation the cost-benefit analysis of, yes, I'm sure this value is great, I'm sure this Lamborghini is really fast and pretty, but can I afford it in the context of my budget? That's the question that we ultimately have to ask ourselves. And I'm doing some quick and dirty math on this, so take it with a grain of salt. But just doing the quick and dirty math, and I think some of these figures match up with some of the things that we've heard in children and families, the average family that pays for childcare is paying somewhere between ten to sixteen thousand dollars a year, and I believe that's per child. There are roughly two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand families in the state who need to engage with childcare services. That translates to somewhere between two and four billion dollars spent on childcare in the state of Minnesota every single year. Now our state budget, which as we all know is a biennium budget, meaning it represents two years, is about $72 billion after you increased it by 40% last year. If you break that down into per year, which is, we all know is, it's not exactly how it works, but just for the sake of argument, $36 billion per year spent in the state of Minnesota. So if we were actually going to do this, if we were going to fulfill this promise, if we were actually going to deliver on the pageantry and pay for people's childcare, it would cost the state somewhere between 5.5% to 11% of our entire state budget. And that's the recently elevated by 40% Minnesota state budget. I don't know, you know, when you're, when you're considering buying something and it's going to cost between 6 and 11% of your entire income for the year, no matter how good it sounds, no matter how much actual functional value it has, it gives you a moment of pause. Do we have the money to do this? And obviously the answer is no, because we're not doing it. There's not a whole lot in this bill to support. Instead of focusing on providing for those promises that have been made and delivering on the sales pitch offered with pageantry, we're instead increasing the size and scope of government, setting up a brand new state agency, creating new careers for state bureaucrats, and potentially funding a fair amount of fraud. On top of that, we've seen extensive discussions in committee about the need to improve the Social Services Information System, or SSIS. We had a debate or over an amendment from Representative Nelson yesterday on that topic. Everybody knows the system is antiquated. He spent quite a, a, a lot of time reflecting upon what it was like in 1992, I believe it was. Was it 99? 99. Yeah, great year. I'll tell you what, I've got a laptop at home that barely works. I bought it 
just after my, or just before my second son was born, so that would have been about 2012. So 12-year-old laptop, yeah, about that time, technology starts to really poop out on you. And we're talking about a system that's twice as old as that, and then some. Um, instead of focusing on fixing that, we're setting up this new Department of Children, Youth, and Families. And it kind of reminds me, I mean, there's a couple of different analogies that pop into the head, like getting spinning rims on your Honda, or buying into a timeshare when you need to fix the plumbing in your house. It just doesn't seem like a very wise financial decision to be expanding, to be building a new agency and investing in new bureaucracy so that we can have more people looking at the system that doesn't work, the system that's causing us problems, something that's recognized on both sides of the aisle, extremely antiquated system, can't do basic things that you would expect any technology to be able to do in the, in the scope and in the role of trying to serve families. But instead of focusing on that, instead of making sure that we have the tools so that, you know, maybe, here's the thing, if we increased the bandwidth of the folks who are already providing these services by giving them the tools they need, maybe we wouldn't need to hire more people and expand the scope of government and set up a whole new agency. But that's not the direction that this bill takes. And again, I'll just highlight the fact that no matter how much you want, and I know you want, to actually fulfill that promise, I know you do. If you could snap your fingers and materialize $4 billion to spend on childcare, you would absolutely do it. But you can't. That's how money works. It's a finite resource. What was her name? The uh, English Prime Minister who talked about once you run out of other people's money? Margaret. Margaret Thatcher, thank you. That's where we're at. You've literally run out of other people's money. $17.5 billion surplus, gone. $10 billion raised in taxes, 40% increase in the state budget, and still can't do what you say you want to do. Well, that's, again, how money works. You run out of it, then you can't do anything anymore. And that's where we're at. And I think there's a lesson to be learned from that that informs how it is that we got to where we're at, where this is even an issue. Because it wasn't. This wasn't an issue when I was growing up. Child care? This wasn't the topic of public debates about how much money, what percentage of the state budget is going to be spent on paying for people's children to be taken care of while they go to work. My dad was the sole breadwinner in a blue collar area. I was brought home to a small house in an inner ring suburb around Detroit. And my dad was the only one who worked. My mom stayed home with us. He paid the mortgage on that house. He maintained two vehicles. Occasionally we went on trips. Occasionally we ate out. We lived a pretty blessed life. It wasn't great, wasn't perfect. There were problems, believe you me. But we got by. And we were never worried about childcare. It wasn't an issue. And as it turns out, you roll back the clock even further, this has been the way of things for all of human history. Child care has not really been an issue that's been a, a topic of political debate. It has become an issue, and this is important, it's become an issue because of exactly this type of irresponsible fiscal management of public dollars. The economy has gotten worse for families, not just here in the state of Minnesota, but throughout the United States of America. It is reflected in the inflation that we're all seeing. I don't know about you, but you know, this is a pretty busy lifestyle, legislating, especially this time of year. Sometimes you have to make some pretty unhealthy food choices, go through the drive through what have you. I've been noticing those prices ticking up in real time, like almost like you're watching a stock ticker. 
and certainly going to the grocery store, going to the gas station. God forbid you try to take your family out. I mean, the, a, a price tag at a bill that comes at the end of a dinner for your family, the, the price that you now have to pay every single time you do it is what I remember paying on like special occasions, right? Like you would go out and really throw caution in the wind and show the family a good time and then get that three-figure bill at the end of the night and go, whew, glad I don't do this every day. Well, now it's pretty much every day. Now if you go out and you're feeding more than two, three people, you're going to be crossing that three-figure barrier. And this is the reality of why we find ourselves where we're at. We sit here and we talk about child care as if this is something that the state has always had to concern itself with. It hasn't. The reason it does have to concern itself with it is because the dollars that people bring home to provide for their families are not worth as much as they used to be by a damn sight. And that doesn't just happen naturally. The way money's supposed to work, value's produced, the money is a representation of that value. It's not supposed to change. It goes up, or the value goes down, because the amount of money goes up, the supply, government spending. The only reason that you were able to increase the state budget by 40% last year, the only reason is because of the money being printed at the federal level. It's because the federal government did you a, a favor and created it out of thin air and then handed it on down in the form of grants. Huge chunk of that surplus that we all celebrated, some of us celebrated more than others, that was one-time federal funds that came hot off the presses of the Fed. And when you do that, when you print money and then you spend it without a equivalent amount of value production, value creation, the value of those dollars goes down. Not right away. The first people to touch it, which are that 1% that ironically you complain about, the rich who keep getting richer, this is why. It's because they get first dibs on the imaginary money we print. And by the time it gets into my hands, your hands, the average Minnesotan's hands, it's worth significantly less. It's a Ponzi scheme. That is what has driven us to where we're at now. And so the problem with this bill is that it fails to acknowledge that. In fact, it continues to double down on the idea that the solution to all our problems is just to spend more public dollars. Let's just spend more of it. Let's continue to suggest ideas that are gonna cost billions of dollars that we don't have, but you know, maybe somebody will print it somewhere. The reality is this state is headed towards a structural deficit. We know it's coming. And it was entirely predictable. I know I was saying it. Math is math. Numbers are numbers. Value is value. You spend it, it's gone. And so what we're headed towards is a scenario where we're gonna have a fancy new agency with a bunch of new hires who are standing around wondering how they're gonna get their job done because their computers don't work. They're pretty good for playing Oregon Trail and not much else. And we don't have any money to allocate for them, to appropriate for them, because we done spent it all. This is a bill that rearranges the deck chairs on a ship that is selling in the wrong direction, and members, we should vote no. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Ramsey, Representative Finke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to speak really quickly to um, the experience that I had working with Chair Pinto and uh, the committee, 
Vice Chair Keeler. Um, I, this is a, I'm new here. As was said earlier, some of us are new here. And the experience that I had with the bill that is in um, this bill was really kind of that, that vision you have when you want to get into doing policy making, where you have community members and they come to you and they say, we have a very specific problem that we think that you can help. And then you go to the chair and you say, I have this problem. How do we solve it? And then we put together a bill and then we get the help of the people around us. And then you build support for it and you bring it and you move it. And it has been like really, re just really rewarding to me. And, and I feel like calling out that um, because I feel sometimes we, we uh, I don't know. I don't know what you do. Sometimes I forget why we're here. I, we spend a lot of time in this room this week. Uh, and so this has just been a really great experience. I'm hopeful that this will go forward. I'm hopeful that my community will get the help that the advocates who came that day to talk to me desperately knew that our community needed, and we're going to shepherd something really good forward. And I just want to thank Chair Pinto for that, uh, Vice Chair Keeler, Coley Colburn, and especially Molly Peterson, who just did so, so much work to help me see this work done. And what we do here is like really cool, and it helps a lot of people. So thank you so much, Chair Pinto. The member from Clay, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I'm really excited to talk about this bill. Um, when we first got elected, we came in in a pandemic. We call ourselves the Corona class. Um, but at the same time, we also had an online division that was talking about preventing homelessness. Uh, Representative New Brindley was on that with Chair Gomez and I, and we really, deeply understood the issues that we have around homelessness. So that you guys know from a number standpoint, um, the point in time count from 2023 says that there's 8,393 individuals on one day that identified as homelessness in this, as homeless in this state. And for any of you who have worked with the point in time count, we know that that's a very low number um, because there's no possible way that we can count everybody in one day. But the point is, that's far too many in my mind. I live in a world that I do really believe that it's important to love our neighbors as ourselves and practice that in, in the work that we do. I often say that I enter into this space to lead with love, and I believe that what this bill has done has done that. Um, but also, I, I understand what you guys are saying about being mindful about money. Um, and I want to kind of spin the narrative, not like we're giving handouts to people, but this is a really fiscal investment. Um, what we know is homelessness and food insecurities do cost Minnesotans. There is a massive tax burden when there's one individual who's experienced homelessness. We learned this in the Preventing Homelessness Division when Dr. Foldis came in and talked to us about a cohort that he did. He worked with over 1,000 youth and followed them for a year. And what we learned in that data um, from 2021, and costs have risen since then, and so I'm sure this number is a little bit low too, but what we learned is in a lifetime of an individual from the age of 16 to 64, which is the average life expectancy, a homeless individual, one homeless individual in the state of Minnesota is a tax burden of roughly $300,000. So now you do the math, and I'm not going to math publicly because I'm not good at math and I'm dyslexic, but just think about $300,000 times the 8,393 people that we have in that state. That's a lot of money that is being spent on individuals that are in Minnesota who I know many of you on both sides of the aisle have experienced some level of homelessness, near homeless, homelessness, or know somebody who really matters to you that has struggled with homelessness at some point in your life. Whether that means you were sleeping in a car during your college life because you couldn't afford rent, whether that means your family had a medical issue that wasted all of your savings in one time and wiped you out and you lost your home and you weren't prepared for it. These aren't just choices. These aren't just people choosing not to do something with their life. This is not go to the boot store and pull your, your bootstraps up. Because to be honest, I've been saying this for a long time. I don't wear boots. I wear moccasins. And we have to create a world where we are seeing everybody for the needs that they have. 
And so I'm really proud of the work we've been able to do. Um, I, I appreciate Chair Pinto allowing me to be a strong voice for homelessness and food insecurities. Um, but I, I think it's important to understand that the data that was shared with us said that only 6% of that cohort had to get out of poverty to offset the cost. And so this is an investment. This is a mass investment. We want a strong, robust economy. And I have said it over and over and over, and you can disagree, but I know that it's true. If you don't have a home to sleep in at night and you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you cannot be your best self. And I think we all believe that we want every Minnesotan to be able to have the ability to be their best self and provide what it is that the creator designed for them to do in this state. And I truly believe with many others that that starts with a home and food. I've appreciated the bipartisan conversation around this and, and really understanding that this is an issue. We weren't able to do enough because we are so far in a deficit when it comes to supporting our neighbors. I do want to give some stats around food insecurity because it's something that we've been able to approach. Food shelf visits, you guys, have gone up 40% in one year. And that is not just in my district, that is in every one of your districts. I'm not gonna do like a raise of hands, but how many of you volunteer at your food shelf or your local food pantry, or you do it with your local church organization, or you donate foods in a food drive for your college? It is everywhere, 40% of an increase in our food shelves. One in six of your neighbors are experiencing food insecurities. One in 11 are kids. They're kids. When I worked in the school districts, I used to have snacks at my office all the time because behavior issues would happen, kids aren't listening. And at the end of the day, when you're hungry, how many of you have sat in here and have enough snacks to last us the 11 hours we're in here? Our brains aren't working when we're hungry. I say it in committee, when we're hungry, we're hangry, and when we're hangry, we're just not our best Minnesotan self. So that's important, but also, as much as we talk about caring about our citizens, this is one of the areas that children and family expands outside of just children and family. We're addressing food insecurities from beginning of life to end of life, and it is really sad to me that the fastest growing community that is utilizing our food shelves are our elders, individuals who are 60 years old or plus are the fastest growing community that are utilizing food shelves. Those are the people who took care of us. Those are the people who taught us the wisdom that we have. Those are the people who led us into the spaces that we're in now and we're starving them. That should be a problem for all of us. The other thing that we were able to do is open up some of the SNAP programming. I am a couponer because I live in poverty and I think couponing in a legislative way at a state level is looking at how we can leverage some of our federal funds. And so what we've been able to do is we've been able to utilize SNAP funding to open up some federal funds. And so what we are doing in this bill is opening SNAP to higher education students. We're identifying that higher education is an occupation that would be eligible for you and your students to be eligible for SNAP. How many of you have higher education institutions or colleges or community colleges or tribal colleges in your community or near your community or you're a parent of somebody who's going off to college, recently was in college or will maybe be in college at one time? We want our kids who are learning at the fastest capacity to be our future professionals to have food in their stomach while they do that. And so I'm really proud of the work we've been able to do in that capacity. I also like that we're actually doing a study to look at the combination of pregnant and parenting youth who are experiencing homelessness. We don't have the answer of how to support them. And so we're doing a study to actually dive into that. We're partnering with the Wilder Foundation, who I think is fantastic in the work that they do around homelessness. And I really believe that they're gonna give us um, legitimate outcomes on what we can do to support um, that specific population. And so I appreciate the work we've been able to do. I appreciate Chair Pinto and our members. Um, I really appreciate our staff. We push our staff in ways um, that is really mean. We make them work late. We make them get up early. Um, I want to acknowledge the front desk staff who continue to stay for us to do this work. You all are really the MVPs in the work that we get to stand up and do. Um, so I, I want to pause and appreciate you along with our committee staff um, and really take a lot of pride in voting green on this bill. Thank you.
The member from Stearns, Representative Damon. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members. I appreciate the debate that we had yesterday, mostly, on this bill. Uh, Chair Pinto, to you, um, I have had the pleasure with of working with you over the years and your commitment and your desire to help families and children was evident from when I first served on your first committee. Um, and I, I do definitely appreciate that. I know Representative Hudson spoke about how you run your committees um, and the hard work that you do. And so I want to say thank you to that. Um, with the bill, I do have some definite concerns as we move forward, and I want to just talk about those a little bit. Um, I do share uh, some of my colleagues and the issues that were brought up, um, the perspectives on the provisions in the bill and where they stand. But what I see this bill at is as more of a growth of government. We know we have a child care shortage. We have needs across the state where we have lost specifically family child care providers, and we have made it so much harder for them to continue in the work, whether it's regulation or if it is pay, if it is the requirements that are put on them, it has made it harder. But with this bill standing up a new state agency and growing government, um, it is not providing that additional child care that parents today are waiting for. Maybe in the future it might happen, but it is not providing those slots immediately as needed. And I believe that the DFL has actually promised the public and led them to believe that we were going to, this body, was going to fully fund child care. But we have heard broken and empty promises over the last year and a half and misplaced priorities. I will say, though, on a positive note, that after the failed attempt to use Feeding Our Future to feed hungry kids in Minnesota, the DFL is finally looking at options that actually empower parents rather than enriching misguided and questionable nonprofits. This bill, though, does symbolize the majority's misplaced priorities by promising everything to everyone. The DFL remained committed to the real priorities, as we have seen. And I remember a former education chair talking about funding the priorities, and those are a moral statement. But we know that the majority in this body, there was enough money to, without any trouble, fully fund the light rail snaking through the Southwest Metro. And there was even extra money to add with a train to Duluth. There is also no trouble funding, fully funding, the new palace for politicians right across the street, $730 million as a floor, not for child care, but to house 134 legislators. There is also no trouble with fully funding any of the other state agencies. But promises of fully funding child care, promises of fully funding education, or even teacher pensions were always left by the wayside, said, well, look at those next year. Or we heard the majority say, we didn't have quite enough money to do that. But it was misplaced priorities. So despite all the big promises, the bill is fairly empty. Similar to the hole that we look out of our windows across the street with the expansion of the state office building. But I'll tell you, that hole by the state office building, day by day is being filled up. And it is being filled up using taxpayer dollars to build a palace rather than funding child care in the state of Minnesota. We know that priorities matter. We should be funding the needs that we have heard from parents and their children before we fully fund hedge fund managers financing the palace for politicians. Members, while I appreciate the work that is done, this is not done completely in the way that we need it to, to best serve Minnesotans, the children, and the families. And with that, I would urge a no vote. To the author of the bill, Representative Pinto. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Leader Dama, thanks for your remarks, and, uh, and I've indeed enjoyed working with you through the years uh, on these issues related to young kids especially. Um, I'm, uh, I've given some thank yous before, but I do need to recognize and thank my Vice Chair, um, Representative Keeler, for her leadership and her partnership, and Lee Daniels, who is uh, going to be retiring and is, was my roommate at the very beginning of our—we we entered the legislature together, um, and we've had a, a really nice partnership, and, and certainly I'm grateful to him and to all the members of the committee. And, and speaking of which, um, for the 100—I think I'm doing the math right—the 119 of you who are not on the Children and Families Committee, you've heard everybody from Representative Davis. Um, I know I spoke with Representative Perez Vega agrees, everybody on our committee, all 15 of us, that there's this IT system called SSIS. Please remember those letters. We have got to make progress on that IT system. Um, and this bill does, in fact, um, do that um, to the extent that the funds would be used in the next year. This, this bill absolutely does do that, and we need to continue on that. So I want to take advantage of the attention that was given to that. Um, so members, typically uh, when there's a discussion about a bill, folks who may be thinking about voting no, they'll talk about what's in the bill that they don't like. We hear a little bit of that. They'll talk about what's not in the bill that they wish were in the bill. Oddly, what I was hearing a lot of was things that aren't in the bill that you don't like anyway, which I think would be a reason to vote in favor of the bill. So there's not universal basic income in this bill. If you dislike that, that would be a reason uh, for you to vote yes. Um, and my apologies if anybody wanted to be in the bill, but this happens not to be. Um, the capital area reconstruction, that's not in the bill. If you dislike that, you are a green vote on this bill. Um, and you know what? If you have concerns with the Great Start Affordability Scholarships, also, as you pointed out, thanks for rubbing it in, also not in the bill. So that would be a reason you're going to vote yes, I would assume. I am grateful, though, that there is such support for public investment in early care and learning. That is something, as you know, that we did a lot of last year. I don't know if folks had the chance to see the Federal Reserve report on uh, child care providers around the state, but a lot of great information about the impact of the work we did last year, and there's a, a, a quote from a provider in Southeast Minnesota saying, the help that the state has provided has been incredibly helpful. Without it, we would really be in trouble. Um, so members, there is so much more to do, and I appreciate the recognition this is a public good that deserves public support. We know how important uh, care and learning is for older kids, and I appreciate the recognition by so many folks in the minority of the importance of that for younger kids as well. And absolutely, that's something that deserves investment, and in fact, it's something that we have invested in, will continue to invest in. And one thing that has not received a highlight in this bill is the reform reforms to, uh, to the uh, regulations relating to, uh, there's a weighted risk system that says to evaluate if there's a particular danger for kids, we're going to take that more seriously, but otherwise we're going to make sure that we're trying to be as supportive for providers as we possibly can. Um, so members, um, there's a big difference that we are making in this, in this bill regarding child care, and it's something that we absolutely do need to continue on. And then an area that has not received a lot of attention, I want to make sure that it does, is child protection. Members, you have seen news articles about this. If you are concerned with our child welfare system, you will be a green vote on the bill. If you're concerned about the fact that when a child dies due to maltreatment, as was highlighted in news articles, our system is cumbersome, is ineffective, problematic. This bill contains a reform to that system, broadly praised, broadly supported. A no vote would be voting against reform of that system. A no vote would be against um, a broader reform to our child protection systems. A no vote would be against taking action to move forward, including towards the replacement of the SSIS system. So I would hope folks would not do that. And finally, I guess uh, there was a lot of talk about, uh, about the investments in the bill, bill spending a lot of dollars. And I guess, members, I am mindful, as Representative Keeler uh, referenced, um, the idea of loving our neighbor. Tomorrow is the National Day of Prayer. A vote in favor of this bill is a vote to feed hungry Minnesotans. It's funding for food shelves in our communities that are seeing spikes in uh, food insecurity and for food banks as well. Spending $10 million in state dollars to have $100 million in federal dollars to make sure that the universal meals that we passed last year during the school year can extend into the summer so we're taking care of our kids. A vote in favor of this bill is to make sure that we have funding for communities experiencing increases in homelessness. And for those communities that may have homelessness providers that may be shutting down, we have funding directly to, to address those issues. Members, we want to make sure that every kid gets off to a great start, that every family receives support, and that Minnesotans get to live in the dignity and have, be able to thrive as we all want that to happen. That's what this bill does. Members, please join me in voting in favor of it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll.
The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol I. Carol I. Howard. Howard I. Howard I. Cagle. Cagle I. Members, please vote. Kago, aye. The clerk will close the roll. There being 68 ayes and 62 noes, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to.